All right, we should be live streaming right about now. So Yep, and we are live. Do we have the neuro itch team all here? Yep. Okay, great. All right, perfect. All right. So we'll um, we'll get started here in just a couple of minutes and then we'll um, explain. You know, I'll do a quick presentation overview of the hackathon and thank our sponsors and then we'll get started. And Kim, you are also an administrator. So I believe if you see people in the waiting room, you can let them in if I'm presenting. Okay. It's like, Kim, do you see Sarah trying to get in? Are you able to admit her? No, I don't see. Oh, you know why? Because I didn't go in as administrator. I just went in as a regular user. That's okay. All right. No, don't worry about it. Let me let me switch out. Hi, Sarah. Thanks for joining us again. <laughs> Sarah is, of course, an alumni to this program and a judge with us last year. Sarah, you may be on mute. I, I can't hear Sarah. Can anybody else hear? No. Oh, she's on mute, yeah. Uh... I will find a way to fix it. Oh, no, no. There you go. I'm oh, you now. I, I think it was just very light. Okay, that's good. I know my microphone is not great. <laughs> All right, so we are live, just so everybody knows, uh, on YouTube. And we will get started in here in just a minute. All right, well, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, here's Kim, Hold one second. Once Kim's joined, then I'll start screen sharing myself and then introduce everybody. All right, Kim, you're in. Okay, you're in as an administrator. So just keep your eye on the participants window in case people are trying to join while I'm presenting. Got it. Um, do you see this one right here, Josh? Nope. All right, let me admit him. All right, I'm just gonna go ahead and start. All righty, let's get to the right window. <laughs> All right, well, everybody, hello and welcome to Magic's fifth annual hackathon, uh, 2021 hackathon. Um, we're really excited to have everybody here today, have our judges. We've got our first presenting teams queued up and ready to go. I'm just gonna run through real quick um, just to do some housekeeping and thank our sponsors. Uh, thank you to our gold sponsors, Carroll Community College and McDaniel College and our silver sponsors, uh, CYAI Cybersecurity Youth Apprenticeship Initiative. If you're interested in signing up to be a, a cybersecurity apprentice, go to their website. Uh, Ting, uh, providers of crazy fast fiber internet here in the city of Westminster and elsewhere, and Panacity, a cybersecurity agency. If I, uh, I'd tell you what they did, but then I'd have to kill you. 
All right, sustaining sponsors. Thank you to Hill Development Group, the City of Westminster, and the Callert Foundation for provide, providing uh, sustaining sponsorship to Magic. Uh, for those of you who love to drink coffee, you can do so and support your favorite nonprofit, Magic, by going to magicinc.org slash magic dash beans and uh, order our uh, famous hacker roast from Furnace Hills Coffee. You'll support both Magic and the great work that Furnace Hills Coffee is also doing. All right, so for our presentations today, I uh, just want to show you real quick what our... Um, our, our contestants, so to speak, are competing for. The best overall pitch uh, team today will receive the purple and green ribbon. And then they'll each get, each team member will get $100 Amazon gift cards. The uh, other categories of best pitch, best tech, best design, and best idea will all receive purple ribbons. And then everyone who presents made it through the hackathon We'll also get a uh, t-shirt, this goldenrod uh, yellow t-shirt with the black hackathon logo. Um, we have uh, some post hackathon support here to mention for those of you who, um, you know, you've come up with a great idea, great business idea, app idea, and you want to take it to the next level. You can certainly connect with us at Magic. We help accelerate businesses and get them going uh, with some um, early help. And then we also have our 1 Million Cups program here in Westminster. It's a program of the Kauffman Foundation, one of the largest philanthropic organizations supporting entrepreneurship. You can apply to present to one of our Wednesday morning meetings. And we also have America's SBDC. They are a national organization, federal organization supporting uh, small businesses around the country. And then if you're here locally, uh, we do have teams, by the way, who are uh, from outside Maryland this, this year because of the virtual format. Uh, but if you are here locally, uh, you should also register to um, present at the Carol Biz Challenge where you can win $10,000 this year. The uh, Carol Biz Challenge, I believe, um, is in August and applications are still open. And then we also have through the Carroll Community College, the Miller Resource for Entrepreneurs. So um, please be sure to take advantage of all these resources, uh, especially if you're here locally. All right, let's meet our judges today. We have, um, these are all, I believe, returning judges, actually. You know, everyone here has judged before. So we have Jen Bishop from Carroll County Public Library. We have Christopher College, who is a venture capitalist with TCP Venture Capital. We have Lauren Samuelson from marketing agency DM. And then we have Sarah Wright, who is a, a, a hackathon alumni and past winner, um, who is back this year again as a judge. She's with Lantern. And then we have Jennifer Young from Inflection and also um, upcoming to, you know, opening on Main Street, Covalent Spirits, a new distillery here in the city of Westminster. So thank you to all of our judges for taking your time today to watch all these presentations. All right, so our Hackathon 2021 teams are Ambrosia, Goat Esports, Informobile, Mall Maps, NeuroIch, Orbit, Public Access 25, RCYCR, I'm not sure if that uh, is, is said a different way, Shove It, and Spot On and Study Smarter. Um, and if you're following us on Instagram or on YouTube or on social media, um, generally speaking, you'll find us at Magic West MD on either Instagram or Twitter. And then uh, please use hashtag Hackathon 2021. Um, we are not going in order, alphabetical order, though, this morning. Um, we will be starting with NeuroIch, which is the team Creative Claw Coders. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen. And again, for those of you who don't know, we are live on YouTube. Also, I want to thank uh, James Heller for contributing our winning logo design uh, for the hackathon this year. Um, so James also won a gift card and he had, of course, his logo presented on t-shirts and all the materials. All right, so NeuroIch, if you're here, go ahead and share your screen, whoever is presenting from your team. Everybody else, please mute while NeuroIch is presenting. Alrighty. Hello, everyone. My name is Lauren, and this is Ren and Haley, and we will be presenting NeuroIch. 
When developing an idea for this app, we thought about many of the issues we faced a year ago, dealing with the shutdown of all non-essential businesses during quarantine. One of them being the lack of stimulating activities to occupy ourselves while we endure insufferable boredom. Another being the huge loss in revenue small businesses face because of the lack of foot traffic in their community and an underdeveloped advertising campaign to their online market. Our solution? Create an app that will cure your boredom with activities and experiences that are fun and intriguing and can only be done in your community through the small businesses and local talent. After researching more into the topic, we found that two thirds of small businesses experienced reduced customer demand during quarantine and later found that 45% of them have earned less than half of their pre-COVID revenue. On the other hand of our research, we found that 30 to 90% of Americans report having daily bouts of boredom. So why not put that boredom to good use? With our market spanning over such a large audience, we have directed our focus into addressing each age group differently to help attract their attention on an individual level, splitting them into categories of children, young adults, and adults. As a result, we developed the app NeuroItch, to enrich your community while curing the itch of boredom. Our app allows you to find activities and products in your community that will cure your boredom through suggestions and advertisements of what your local businesses have to offer. In order to keep our customers invested, we decided to make our app free to all consumers. Our revenue will strictly come from the display ads that are paid for by small businesses through the pay per click method, which is a more direct form of marketing online. After analyzing statistics, we determined that our serviceable available market at the moment would be 30% of the Carroll County population. To make it fairly inexpensive for small businesses to advertise, our cost per click is 20 cents. Now, the average person sees anywhere from 300 to 1000 ads per day. And if every person in that 30% clicked on 300 ads within a year, our app will generate over $3 million in revenue. The adoption of our app will rely on local communities and consumers to encourage small businesses to get involved and expand their market through our app. Apps that we may compete with are wellness apps, Groupon, and Suggestion Box, which is an activity suggestion app on a small scale. But what keeps us above those apps is the combination of their ideas by providing wholesome activities as well as advertisements for small businesses in your local area. When planning our design, we wanted to focus on a user-friendly experience that is easy to use and pleasing to the eye. In our prototype, we developed a category system for users to navigate through based on their age and the activities they're interested in. After deciding on your age category, you can choose an interest-based icon to help you find an activity that entices you and will open up a page with suggested content with an ad or link to a small business that can provide the resources or product for your activity. To communicate our ideas on a visual level, the colors in our logo inspire productivity and creativeness through color psychology and use imagery of the brain to reinforce active simulation of one's thoughts. We also use soft illustrative design to make everything cohesive and visually appealing to the viewers. By adapting the advertiser's design to our aesthetic, it allows to be more approachable to, view, to viewers, making them more likely to click on the ad. In overview, during quarantine, many people had an overwhelming sense of boredom due to the closing of many non-essential businesses. The shutdown also caused many small businesses and local community events to close entirely due to the heavy loss in revenue. Through this app, people can support small businesses on a virtual platform and help cure insufferable boredom. This will make it easier for small businesses, local artists, and writers to advertise to their community and become accessible on a virtual environment. For our demo. All right. Haley, if you'd like, thank you. All right. 
If you notice, each age category has a cohesive color scheme to the logo, but the primary color in each branch cater to a specific age group to help with organization. We thought of user interface while designing and incorporated arrows on pages to make it easier for the user to transition between pages before and after. By making the logo the link to the homepage, users can go back to any category they wish. One of the things that wasn't mentioned earlier in our business model was the cost structure and what it will take to maintain the app. We will need to pay, our, pay for app labor, programming, employee wages, graphic designers, and data and billing software to help keep track of how many clicks per advertisement and bill accordingly. Here is our code. It's a screenshot of it, but if you click the link in the PDF that we submitted, it'll lead you to a Google Drive containing all of the code. And thank you all for listening. Do you have any questions? Excellent job, Lauren and Neuro Itch. Thank you very, very much. Um, we have a few minutes left. We have four minutes left for judges to have questions. Uh, judges, go ahead and unmute and just jump right in. I have one more question for the, for the team. How do you plan to uh, get your content into the app? Or are you gonna curate it or are you gonna have people submit their own content or suggestions? So we plan to have people submit their own ads um, and then we would redesign them to make it fit our aesthetic, the design to make it more cohesive and more likely for people to click on them. But in terms of the generic content of what we'd be suggesting on top of the advertisements, we, it might be ourselves or it might be a team that part of the revenue would go towards paying. Thank you. Judges, any more questions? I do have one. Um, what you said mentioned about people having ads in the application, um, how would you go about acquiring those companies and that would add those ads to your application? And what type of companies would you want to host ads on the application? So many of the businesses we wanted to attract are found in local small cities like uh, Westminster, like. Uh, small town Westminster, small town Sykesville, places like that, things that will that tend to host events or have a great product for selling. Like in one suggestion we have is for a book. So it would recommend a local bookstore in your area that is normally a smaller uh, business, unlike Barnes and Nobles, which is a big corporation. So to attract more people, um, we rely a lot on the community and social media and getting uh, people to work with us. And I do have one more question. Um, what was your application built in? Uh, we built Adobe our wireframes in, yeah, Adobe XD. I have, a, I have a question, Graham. Go ahead. Um, so could you go into a little more detail to differentiate uh, the service that your app will provide, um, I guess, compared to other current sources that people can go to to get information about local small businesses, right? There are lots of groups and directories and other um, sources for folks currently today. So how would this be much different um, and how would you kind of draw in people to actually use your app? I think I can answer this one. Uh, so uh, a big thing right off the bat when we were making this uh, was the idea of, well, if people have free time, a lot of times what people do is, you know, just go to YouTube and watch videos or whatever. But we really wanted to focus on um, having uh, things or ideas that would be um, self-enriching and while at the same time providing an opportunity to go and discover uh, local businesses that would provide the same sort of thing. So it would be like, okay, here's something we can give to you now, but if you want to continue um, having 
whatever the suggestion you asked for, having something that would continue to uh, have that sort of enrichment while also providing enrichment for the community, that's what the advertisement would help you link towards. Thank you very much. Um, that's all the time we have for questions from the judges and we are gonna move right along. So thank you very much, NeuroItch. That was a great presentation. Thank you. Thank you guys. Um, thank you. Up and you're welcome to all hang on. Everyone can hang on and, and watch the rest of the presentations, um, just so you know. Um, all right, the next team up is 404 Brain Not Found with an app called Goat Esports. Goat Esports, are you here? Yeah, we're here. All right, great. Go ahead and share your screen, whoever is presenting your pitch, and take it away. Everyone else, please mute. You guys can see that, right? All right. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the greatest of all time esports. Win with your dream esport team. My name is Ashley Ott. I'm Natasha Interlikia. I'm Ben Interlikia. And we are GOAT Esports. So COVID-19 has resulted in less human interaction, so we've had to find new ways to connect. Um, unfortunately, many gaming fans don't have an easy way to connect with their friends and support their favorite professional esport teams. We wanted to create GOAT Esports so that fans of video games can come together to create their dream team and compete with other fans for points. It is a way for gaming fans to connect with other fans and their friends. This app provides a new way to socialize while testing your player knowledge. For this prototype, we're we are using CSGO tournaments, which already has a large fan base. So here's our product overview. We've got two game modes, Predict the Play and Dream Team. And the objective of these game modes is to win trophies to move up on the global leaderboard in game. So for the first game mode, pretty simple. There are these actual CSGO teams that play in ESL tournaments, and you have to correctly guess who's going to win the match. For our second game mode, Dream Team, you and five other people rank the 30 players in an ESL CSGO group. So then the computer, based off of your and the five other people's rankings, will create uh, six different Dream Teams with different players. And throughout this actual CSGO tournament, users gain points based on how the players of their team perform in the ESL tournament. So by the end of the tournament, depending on how many points you get, determines how many trophies you win or lose. And this is inside the app, some like the more drag and drop based coding. Uh, this is the predict the play page on our app. And this is more, for future development, we want to have more user data, such as maybe a profile picture and a username. And we want to have more game modes, like maybe a clip system where you can submit your favorite clips of your favorite pros. And finally, other games, you know, like maybe Fortnite expand to in the future instead of just CSGO. We want to have a friends list so you can add friends you meet in game or friends from real life. And finally, advertisement spots so we can make more money to keep our amazing game going. As we've talked about, CSGO has a wide following range. 2.1 billion people in 2020 played video games. In 2021, 557 million people watched esports and over 1,000 active users monthly on CSGO. ESL CSGO has 4.6 million followers on Twitch, 385,000 followers on YouTube, and 243,000 followers on Instagram. So we already have, there's already a lot of people that use fantasy eSport type apps like DraftKing and Strafe both have 1 million downloads on Google Play and HLTV and DraftBuff have another, another 150,000 downloads. Our target age range is going to be 12 to 30. So 70% of people in the United States use social media and 90% of these people are in the age range of 18 to 29. Since our app is similar to a social media app, we think that people in this age range would enjoy using it. 67% of females and 54% of males felt lonely at college and 46% of Americans feel lonely while 47 feel left out. And so obviously a lot of people want new ways to connect since they feel lonely. So we hope to provide that through our app. These are some of our competitors. And so some of our competitive advantages are, is that our app is really simple to use and easy to play. And we have balanced game modes through our trophy system because the different game modes give you trophies to move up on that global 
uh, leader board. And then we have more game modes and it's free to use. And so this shows the three different aspects of uh, these eSport things or apps. And we have three, all three aspects while the other competitors only have one or two. We'd like to get our app out through doing advertisements. We'd like to do ads through ESL advertising, Google and YouTube ads. We'd also like to advertise through esports clubs in colleges and high schools and plan to do player partnerships and sponsors. We have three ways we wanna make money, doing advertisements for all general users. They can add upgrades ad free for a $5 fee and then upgrade from that to the paid version for another $5. In the paid version, they have access to more games. It's time for a demo. So right here, I think you guys should be able to still see that. And then I can go ahead and log in. And this is using bubble.io. So here's our homepage of our app. First, I can navigate to the leaderboard where I can see all the different trophies. We're in rank number 11 with 194. Go back home, look at the predict the play game mode where there you go. So you can see the upcoming uh, ESL matches. You can choose who you think is going to win. And finally, Dream Team. In our first game, the users are still ranking the players. So we've got these two other players in the game. And then for us, we still need to rank our different players. So we can go back to the Dream Team homepage. Look at game two. And you can see the different points that we have based off of our uh, CSGO fantasy teams. And we can even see other people's. And then finally, if we'd like to create a new game, we can just go down here, new random game or a game with friends. And then once we're all done using the app, we can just go ahead and log out. So that's all. Any questions? Excellent job. Thank you, Goat Esports. Um, all right, judge, go ahead and stop screens. Thank you. And, and uh, judges, uh, please unmute if you have any questions. We have about four, three to four minutes left for questions. I have a quick question. So for the competitors that you mentioned, I know I'm not familiar with all of them, but I believe some of them do other um, online, you know, betting and gambling. Is for this, is are you the, you know, the only app that's looking at esports only and kind of targeting that market? Yeah, currently um, most of our competitors are doing things other than just esports. We want to focus on esports. There is one competitor that I think mainly focuses on esports as well, but they're way lesser known than all of our other competitors. Any other questions from the I have, Yeah, one quick question. So some of your competitors actually um, use real dollars while some of the other ones are more of a, a ranking system to try to inspire people for um, virtual prizes. Are, are you planning on being the, the previous or the, or the latter? I think we were thinking more just like, just points in the game instead of actual money. Because, you know, kids, you know, aren't going to want to be betting, right? Gambling. Not exactly. Great for the age range of 12 to 30. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? All right. Well, thank you very much to Goat Esports. Great job presenting, great demo. Thank you. Um, you are more than welcome to stay and watch the rest of the presentations as well. Um, I just want to real quick, thank our sponsors one more time, Carroll Community College, McDaniel College, Cybersecurity Youth Apprenticeship uh, Initiative, <laughs> Ting, Crazy Fast Internet and Panacity. Um, all right, so we have a little bit of time. We're actually ahead of schedule now. So uh, Spot On, Team Grace Network with Spot On. Are you here yet? We are yep, here. we're all here. Okay, excellent. Well, go ahead, whoever's presenting, and share your screen. And everybody else, please mute while we hear from Spot On. Uh, 
Alrighty. Can everybody hear me okay? I can hear you. Perfect. Thank you. So we are Team Grace Network. I'm Courtney O'Connor. My two teammates presenting with me today are Joshua and Juliet. And then our other two teammates that worked with us were Amir and Micah. We will be presenting our app, Spot On. So we decided on our slogan to be a spot for you, a spot for me. So the problem that we wanted to address was that in a large amount of big cities, there is a lack of public parking, but not a lack of parking spots. So without the available parking, these cities cannot make their maximum revenue from restaurants, entertainment, and other tourist attractions. Our solution is to create a platform for users to place their available parking spot that they own on the app for other users to rent for the day, week, or month. Those looking for a parking spot would be able to search the area to find available parking and see the price per day that the spot owner would like to rent it for. The parking then can be reserved ahead of time so there will be no scrambling for a spot when you arrive and instead you can just enjoy your trip. Our four main points we wanna focus on are stay close, save time, utilize the vacant spot and stay safe. So in the United States, uh, the parking industry alone generates more than $20, uh, $20 billion for, per year in revenue. Um, that's $345 per year per driver. Um, and parking and economic development are directly correlated with one open on street parking space being valued at $20,000 $20, per year and revenue to the local economy. However, many cities struggle with maintaining a proper balance between the ratio of population to parking spaces. And so for our market validation and the heart for parking in 2017, 42% of drivers missed an appointment, 23% of drivers experienced road rage, and 34% of U.S. drivers abandoned a trip entirely. So for, our, um, for the parking garages in the United States, there's uh, more than 40,000, and uh, the result of the web of gatekeepers that control the parking supply regionally and often are conflicting objectives, even in the regard um, to the very asset owners that they represent. So in, in this environment, entrepreneurs are attempting to put forth elegant solutions to disrupt parking um, that are required to create harmony to, yeah, to disrupt parking are required to create harmony with each cell side entity, which is no easy task. Um, 105 million uh, for residential parking spaces in the U.S., as well as 2.3 billion trips made by car within cities in the U.S. per year for our market size. And this uh, is our product. Uh, we do not have a demo today, uh, but we definitely have uh, screenshots and we have our product completely planned out. Um, we'll, you will search for the area, whether you want to reserve an area or to search for the areas near you and uh, using the uh, sort of find a spot. And then you would uh, review the listings that we would have, where we would have like $2 per hour or anything in the general area. And then finally you would reserve your spot. So when trying to think about how our app could adopt to um, different kinds of markets, depending on what cities we're in. We really tried to focus on um, the perspective of how you would use it um, as, as the user using the app, right? So um, sometimes it, it, it so happens that a lot of the, a lot of times when you're visiting an area, you get parking spaces that are not close to your intended destination. So, um, we, we were thinking about really large cities that um, see a lot of tourist attractions um, and the numbers there are the amount of available parking spaces that total in the city. So, but when doing the research for the market, it just turned out that even though these cities had an extreme amount of parking spaces, the um, parking density was concentrated in areas that were really popular, which is what um, this diagram that we see on the bottom right so the it so like there's a lot of unavailable parking in the red areas but a lot of available parking in the green areas the problem is is that is that drivers don't necessarily know where this available parking is so we thought we could 
potentially partner with um, Airbnb and Lime. So people could not only um, advertise their, people could not only advertise their rooms, but, you know, we could also, um, as an incentive to park somewhere that's a little bit farther from your destination, you can, um, there could be a little electric scooter there to make it easier for you to get to where you want to go. Next slide, please. So we thought about when developing our business model, we wanted to um, really leave it up to the user to be able to put the cost of their parking spot based on um, like a relative cost of the area. You know, if you're living in New York City, if you're living in Times Square, the cost of that you want to advertise for your parking spot is obviously going to be a little bit more expensive than if you're in New Jersey. But um, and when predicting um, a, a standard revenue base annually, we just decided to average like a $10 rental for any kind of workday for any parking spot. And that is what you see here in the graph. Can I get the next slide, please, Josh? And we just, in this last slide, we were just addressing the, comp, the competitive apps that kind of do the same thing. Um, Park Mobile, virtual parking meter on your phone, Parkopedia, so you can get directions near an open parking spot, Hero, prepay for garage valet and airport parking. But it just so happens that we didn't feel like any of these any of these apps were very um, user friendly based. You know, they didn't really um, it what you didn't it wasn't easy to operate them with the user in mind. But for our app, we intend to really um, try and focus on that like human connection between um, somebody who's really willing to give you their parking spot when they don't need it, and then somebody who really needs that parking spot instead. So yes, and I think I'll talk about it on the next slide. These are the competitive advantages that we just wanted to focus on, um, but I, I just talked about that on the last slide. So I think that wraps it up. Okay, thank you so much, you guys. Any questions? Great job. Thank you, spot on. Uh, great presentation. Um, go ahead and unshare your screen and we will have the judges unmute and uh, judges feel free to jump in with any questions. kinds of parking spaces people will be renting out like I have a parking space that I could theoretically rent out but I have a sticker that I have to have on my car to be able to park there I would get towed if I didn't have the sticker how are people putting their parking spaces up for grabs um I can answer this one so if you're living in an apartment complex where maybe your parking space is owned by you but it has to have proof that it's you using it or else you'll get towed obviously we were thinking we could maybe start partnering with those apartment buildings so they're aware that this spot will be also used. And then we are using kind of a check-in system because when you see the parking meters like Park Mobile, they have a QR code. So we're thinking our spots could also have a QR code. So anybody that's a parking meter police could scan it, see that's checked in with somebody on spot on and then know that it's being paid for and they don't need to tow it. Okay, thank you. Good presentation team and uh, a really uh, big problem and good idea. I, I think one of the questions I would have is that your, your competitors have been around for several years, have been working on that program problem for a while now. H how do you plan to, to compete with the competitors that have um, you know, lots of money and have been at it for several, several years already? Um, so our competitors, none of them let you list your own parking spot so far that we've been able to find. Like Park Mobile, you can reserve, in, all of those you can reserve before you get there, but it's in a garage or in a meter parking. There's none that if you leave for the day and you're not in your driveway all day and you live in Baltimore City, you can't rent that out to somebody that may be commuting to the building across the street. So that's kind of where we want to have the new market and then also for things like small tourist attractions without any parking near them, such as like Magic Gardens in Philadelphia, there's no parking right there on the street. So we could partner with the tour boards of the cities and kind of get the word out there. A quick comment, um, double check Spot Hero. I'm pretty sure I think renting your own spot is something that Spot Hero offers. Okay, thank you. Thank you.
Yeah, Spot Hero has a, you can rent out your own spot, like an Airbnb kind of model, right? You can rent your own spot kind of stuff. So I think they actually have that as part of their business model where you can kind of rent out your own spot and earn a little extra cash. So double check that a little bit more because I think they already offer that. I think some other sites are all, some other apps are also moving towards that direction. Um, the logistics are tough as one of the earlier questions kind of touched upon. Um, but I would look into your competitors a little bit more on what would make you guys different. Thanks so much. And there was a Baltimore-based company called Parking Panda, I think, that did that as well. Yeah, sure. Parking Panda does. I've, I've used a lot of these because I work in D.C., so I use a lot of these different apps and try them out a lot. Um, Parking Panda does too. Some of them focus more on street, garage. Rental is a newer one, but, um, but it's a great idea. I just uh, I would say look into your competitors a little bit more because I think some of this stuff is already being addressed. Thanks so much. Thank you. Judges, any other questions? All right. Well, thank you very much. Spot on. Great job. All right. Do we have, let's see, Ambrosia, the team Olympian with the app Ambrosia. Are you here? Have a great day, everyone. Thank you. All right, Ambrosia, Ambrosia, are you here? I think they may be joining right now. We're a little ahead of schedule, believe it or not. <laughs> All right. We'll just give them another couple of minutes. Ambrosia, Hello. Team Ambrosia, if you're here, go ahead and unmute. Hey. <clears throat> Hello, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Uh, yes, we can hear you now. Yep. Okay. And, um, Feel free, if your team is all here and you're ready to go, uh, feel free to start sharing your presentation and everybody else will mute while you're presenting. All right, we're waiting for one person. He's joining in like just a minute. Yeah, uh, try it again, Eli. Mm -hmm. Yep, okay. And while they are all coming in, I will just remind everybody that um, this is our fifth annual hackathon. Thank you to our sponsors, Carroll Community College, McDaniel College, Panacity, Ting, and the Cyber Security Youth Initiative. All right, we're all here. You all ready to go? Okay, great. So everybody else, please mute while Ambrosia takes it away. Go ahead and share your screen. Okay, can you hear me? <clears throat> yeah, we Hello. can hear you. Okay, cool, cool. <clears throat> Hello, everyone. Welcome to our presentation. Today, we will be presenting you the app we created called Ambrosia. This is a social media app that brings food enthusiasts together to like, share, and explore new foods and restaurants. This app is brought to you by our group, Olympian. Here are a few problems. Networking. Food enthusiasts have no way to share their discoveries or creations with other peers. In terms of marketing, small businesses don't have access to large-scale publicity due to lack of revenue. They are unable to buy large billboards or get proper social media coverage. And finally, indecisiveness. Does your significant other want to get food but doesn't know what to get or is craving? Well, we have created a solution for all these problems. Our mobile application where users can discover and share their food and cravings, promote their business without reaching down into their profits or savings, and finally, decide on what to eat so we don't have to have unnecessarily long arguments. In terms of market validation, why should the application exist? Well, 45% or roughly 113 million people of American adults aged 18 and over are known to be cooking enthusiasts. Another interesting stat is 53 million adults dislike cooking, but have advanced or very advanced skills. And finally, 53% of Americans consider themselves to be foodies. In terms of our market size, well, the total available market is the globe. And since our device is for mobile users, there are 2.71 billion smartphones registered globally. The serviceable available market is the US, since our company doesn't have the proper funding to launch globally. 
So our estimated market in our country is around 294.2 million smartphones. And finally, our target market. Our target market is the DMV region. By sharing our app on social media and asking friends, family, and coworkers to interact and share the app, we believe our app could reach all 8.07 million smartphone users in the area. And finally, our product. Here is our loading screen. This is what it would look like if you were to first open the app. Then you are taken to our home screen where you can find all the accounts and food categories you follow. Our interface allows even teens to interact with our app without confusion and with a simple layout. In our demo, we will present to you the more completed version. Now, I would like to hand you off to Eli where he will talk about our business model. Okay, so for the business model, of course, you know, ads, ads, ads. Uh, here are some different prices for types of ads. Now, assuming that 1.5% of users would click on banner ads, and then there are 50,000 ads per day, we'd make $75 per day minimum, and that's roughly 27,000 a year. And after 100 years, we will be millionaire, baby. <laughs> yes, that's spelled correctly. Uh, for the market adoption, the first thing we'll have to do is promotion, and we'll make Ambrosia accounts on other social media apps to do it. The accounts could then be used to inform people about Ambrosia. And after that, we would move on to the trials. We'll have users download the app and try it out. And then we'll get feedback from them and improve on the app based on their responses and for our competition. So a lot of mainstream social media apps have quite a few benefits, such as the high user volume. You know, celebrities use them. You know, they're popular. They have rep and status. However, these companies' drawbacks are our benefits. So for one, we're the first to market. Ambrosia is the first social media app just for the foodies. And there are social media accounts for food on those other apps. But as far as we know, there aren't specific social media apps dedicated to food, at least on this scale. And for the design and brand, most mainstream social media apps don't have a theme or more gimmick. Uh, Ambrosia is centered around Greek mythology. So in the app, you can associate things like seafood with Poseidon, spicy food with Hades, or airplane food with Zeus, if you're into that. But before I hand it over to Chris for the demo, I wanna close by saying this. Think about how many culinary geniuses there are on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and TikTok. And they can't get their names out there because their content is constantly being overshadowed by relationship status and dance trends. Ambrosia would give them a space where they can learn, grow, promote themselves, build connections, and potentially get the job of their dreams. And if we can help them achieve that, then it becomes something much bigger than food. Thank you. All right, so now I will take over the screen and I will be going over our demo. All right, so now you should be able to see my screen. So if I preview the app, so first you will see the loading screen. After a few seconds, it will jump to the home, to the home screen. So the, on the home screen, you'll see your home feed and you'll see different accounts that you follow and different foods that are shared. So here we have some sample posts that we made and you can interact with the post. You can like the post, you can share or repost the post. You can comment, view other comments. And then we have this filter feature at the top. So if you click on the filter, you can select what types of food you would like to see on your main feed. So if you want to see breakfast, for example, if we click breakfast, click the filter again, now we only see breakfast. If you want to see seafood, click seafood, filters only seafood. If you want to see uh, elegant food and meal prep, filter it. And now you see we have the meal prep right here and some fine wine right there. And then if you just disable all of the select options, you'll go back to your original feed, all right? And then if we go to the bottom, we have our navigation. So if we, if we want to explore, reach out, see what other people are posting, what other people are sharing, have different categories. So in our demo, we only have two categories, so sandwiches, sushi, but there would be a lot more to this, like sandwiches, sushis, desserts, like all kinds of things. And you would be able to click on it, see who posted it, like the location of it, you'd be able to follow, reach out to these people. 
then if you go on the bottom, we can create a post. So you can upload your own post. You can take a photo. You can upload a pre-existing photo in your camera roll. And then if we go to direct message, this would be where people message, share things with you. You could write your own messages to people, reach out to people, click the write the message button to make a, po uh, to make a message, to compose a message. And then right here, it would be a list of your messages that you receive. Lastly, in our profile, you'll see your own profile. So here we have Apollo. You, uh, you would put your profile pic, your name, quick bio, and then you would have all of your food posts. So whatever you're making, whatever you're seeing, whatever you'd like to share. And we just have the simple image gallery. We have the setting button at the top right and we have a cravings button on the top left. So when you, the idea is when you click the cravings button, it will launch a survey. Survey, it will ask you what kind of food you like. Once you select the food you like, it will update your bio and then other people can see what kind of foods you like. And they have their cravings. So if somebody's into sugary foods and they say in the cravings, they like desserts. Well, I, I like desserts. And then Eli, he could see that I like desserts. He'll send me a friend request. We get to talking, sharing ideas, recipes, and places to eat. You can reach out to people and yeah, network, share uh, lots of food ideas, make new buddies. Mm -hmm. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. All right, great job, Ambrosia. Um, go ahead and unshare your screen, and we will bring our judges back. Uh, great presentation, guys. Um, I particularly love your, you. very, your very realistic revenue projections. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, judges, uh, any questions for Ambrosia, for the Ambrosia app? I have one. Um, how would it benefit me more from a business standpoint to utilize Ambrosia over creating, say, like a food-based Instagram where there's already a food following on Instagram? Uh, I would like to answer that. So <laughs> um, to be quick and easy, uh, with Instagram, there, if you have an account and let's say you have 1,000 followers or 2,000 followers, you have a pretty good following. So it's easy for those followers to expand and network your account. They could share it. They can send it in direct messages or on Facebook. But... At the same time, if you only have 10, 15, or 20 followers, it's really hard to be able to increase that network since you would be covered up with other people posting on Instagram about sports, about you know news reports, and about other things, whether it's like a vacation post. But with our app, you would be allowed to grow at a much higher and more significant rate just because everyone on the app would be there for one reason, to encourage each other to discover new things and to explore new wonders that you never would have if you weren't on Instagram only. All right, thank you. I have a question and I might've missed it in your presentation. Is there a, a geographical element to the app? Um, geographical. As, as of right now, there isn't, but we look to implement it. Um, like, oh, well, each post they'll have locations. So you'll be able to pull up a map and it would show like where these places are located and you could share the locations with other people, if that's so what in, you mean. In future settings, we would be able to uh, create uh, a setting where you could set a 50 mile radius or hundred mile radius saying, you wanna explore foods nearby you because what's the point of seeing someone's account or someone's food if you're in California and someone else is in Michigan. Mm -hmm. So the best thing was we wanted to set some kind of radius that you would pick because some people are like me, I'd be willing to drive an hour to get the best burger in town. Other people might not want to, they only want to drive 10 or 15 minutes. So yes, we would implement a setting later on with like a radius to okay. determine how far you're willing to go. And that is something I think um, that'd be a great thing for you guys to add because there are um, a lot of foodie groups that exist, for example, on Facebook and mm -hmm. they are mostly geographically location-based and they get a lot of activity and it's great for local restaurants too because people eat there, they post it, someone else goes there too. So the, the geography thing for the foodies we like to find stuff around us, right, for that. So that would be a great thing for you guys to add to your, to your app. Of course. Thank and you I also think what you guys are competing against, too, is that, like, on Facebook, for example, there are some established groups with tens of thousands of followers that do just this, and they share, they talk, they whatever. So I would say, as you look at your competitors, too, um, dive into some of those places as well and see some of the nuggets, the, the benefits of that, and try to replicate that, um, because you're going to have to have to move people over to your app. 
right? Um, yeah. That could be a difficult thing to do to move people from what they're doing today on an existing app to move to another app that is just starting up. So, so think about that too as you move forward. Thank you very much for your feedback. Thank you. Thank you. Judges, any other questions? If not, going once, going twice. All right. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Again with Ambrosia. I love the consistency on your Greek uh, theme there as well, I have to say. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you. Notice Dionysus was the, was the wine god there for your elegant uh, uh, category. Very clever. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. All right, Thank we're going to move right along. Um, let's see. We have the next team is Team 5 with the app Orbit with two Bs. Team 5 with Orbit, are you here? I am here. All right. Oh, James Heller. Okay, great. Is your whole team here? Uh, I am here I'm, too. Yes. Yep. All right. Well, go ahead and share your screen and everybody else, please mute and take it away, Orbit. All right, is it viewable? Yes. Okay. Um, hello, I am James Heller. And I'm Shayan Tar. Uh, this is our app, Orbit, learning skills in your orbit. So the problem we are trying to solve here is that standardized testing has largely replaced home economics courses in schools, as well as parents being too busy with their own jobs to pass on important skills. Skills that used to be commonplace for home repair and maintenance are now considered specialist careers. These skills are now heavily monetized by specialist industries. Our solution is Orbit. It is an app that allows users to learn skills in their orbit from creators directly and allows users to support these teachers directly as well. With simple skills demonstrated via short videos called bits, users will be able to choose what skills to develop and what teachers to uh, directly support. This method compensates teachers, teaches practical skills, and assists young adults. So uh, in 2000, or yeah, in 2012, uh, 22.7 million high school students and college students were enrolled in uh, high school and college, uh, and only 3.5 million of those students were enrolled in FCS uh, secondary programs, um, which is a decrease of 38% from the previous decade. Uh, only 15% of those students were enrolled in home economics course courses with the demand of these skills only rising as more home ec courses are cut from curriculum. So our market size, uh, Skillshare, which is a web-based service that provides online courses, um, has made 15 million in tw or 2020 alone. And Skillshare has 5 million users uh, 6,000 teachers, um, and their whole, their whole website is, uh, has an emphasis on specialist, uh, education. TikTok has six, 689 million monthly active users worldwide with a small portion of the site being based on short tutorial videos. So to use our product Orbit, you can either make an Orbit account follow relevant teachers and skills, and subscribe to teachers to support them directly and gain access to extra lessons. Or you can make your Orbit account and pay a one-time creator fee and gain access to SEO tools, added features for teaching via video, and more tools for creators. Our business model would be primarily receiving a small percentage of those subscriptions to creators, which would be determined by users, and other users can pay that one-time fee of $5.99 to gain access to those advanced video settings and SEO assistance and ad-free bit viewing. Additional revenue can be generated by short advertisements before bits. With an emphasis on supporting creators to generate ad revenue and interest in the application, a majority of Orbit's revenue would be made from subscriptions and one-time creator tool purchases. So um, our market adop adoption, which is our, how are we gonna get people coming to our app? So 25% are gonna be doing paid in our paying influencers, um, so sponsoring them. Um, and also is going to travel through word of mouth. So people talking about it. 
30% will be from advertisements um, on competitive competing sites or just anywhere, any site. And 45% is going to be um, attempted mar- uh, viral marketing campaigns on social media, such as like Twitter, Facebook, um, and other apps like that. As for our competition, Skillshare is Orbit's closest direct competitor, though it focuses heavily on college equivalent skills and courses. TikTok has a decent user base of creators who make tutorials and lessons, though due to the app's emphasis on other content, it isn't exactly a direct competitor. Plus, getting paid on TikTok is not exactly what the site's meant for. Our competitive advantages are that we pay creators directly. Users can choose what bits to watch and who to subscribe to. We have creator-driven pricing. Teachers can personalize their pricing based on skill and length of lessons, and it teaches what is valued by the community. Lessons can range from how to wash dishes to crash courses on graphic design, economics, and more. And right before we get to questions, we have a short demo of the app. Here we have our main home screen that you get to when you launch the app. You can log in either with phone, email, or other applications that you may already have. And then when you load in, the app would automatically either recommend you a relevant bit to your interests or something that you're already subscribed to. From here, you can check out the comments on that bit to see if there's any extra context or information you can learn from the creator. And you can go to your home screen to manage your subscriptions, creator settings, or anything else. Likewise, on the bit screen, if you are a creator, you can also upload your own bits from the screen. These can be any lessons that you are teaching or skills you want to share, or they can be monetarily based, trying to maybe sell these skills to people who would want them. And as well, there would be a search function, which would recommend you more things perhaps relevant to your interests based on bits and subscriptions you already have, or just a new skill you might want to learn. And that currently concludes our demonstration. We are now open to questions. Great job, Orbit. Thank you very much, James and Cheyenne. All right, judges, uh, go ahead and unmute and let us know if you have any questions. This is a Chris, great presentation, uh, well, well done. I, I wasn't quite sure um, when you described FCS, what, what types of skills you're focused on and, and which universe you're going after. Well, uh, great question. So in terms of pitching the app, it's always important to pitch an app with lots of college level skills involved in the pitch. But the real draw for this app would be trying to teach young adults some things that were maybe missed as those home economics courses were removed from school. Yes, there will be people who are able to teach you graphic design and other important college and worldly skills. But This app should have a major focus on learning things like how to repair pipes in your house, what to do if there's a leak somewhere, and just skills you might want to develop so you don't have to call up a plumber and spend a few extra hundred dollars when maybe you could fix it with stuff you have at home. Very helpful. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I have a question. How are you planning to vet the content that's being put up on the app to make sure it's accurate? That is a great question. Presumably, we would hope to have human moderators uh, working with this um, system, but at the very least, the um, one-time creator fee would be a little bit of a um, method of blocking trolls and other people who just want to spread false information. Generally speaking, if there is a paywall involved, people who just want to spread false information aren't going to waste time with it. So I'm a young adult who doesn't know how to do things. Um, And I found that a lot of the information that I need to find is already on YouTube. How are you going to incentivize young adults who didn't take home ec to use your app? Hopefully by having everything in a more concise place and not necessarily making you pay for all that content. It is um, very important for this app to have everything you would need to know on a given subject taught by an expert in that subject. 
on YouTube, you can go to a lot of channels that have a, um, a wide variety of uh, topics and stuff. But if that creator isn't exactly being compensated, they're not going to continue making those tutorial videos and stuff. So hopefully by creating an app that compensates those directors for their work uh, directly, that will incentivize more in-depth lessons in a more consistent area. That makes sense, thank you. I do have a question as well. How are you going to go about compensating these uh, people who are putting their videos onto the application? Great question. The compensation would actually come from the user base. Uh, there are currently sort of um, uh, different sites online like GoFundMe, Patreon specifically. Uh, Patreon allows you to pay a creator for a certain type of content. But generally, Patreon focuses on entertainment-based content or, or materials, right? Creating an actual item. Whereas this site would be you paying a teacher directly for those skills. And Orbit would take a small percentage of that. Okay, thank you. Judges, any other questions? All right. Thank you very much, Orbit and Team Five. Great job, James and Cheyenne. Thank, Thank you. you. All right. Do we have our next team, the Vortex with the app Shove It? Are you here? I'm here, yes. Is your whole team ready or are you still waiting on some people? Um, I'm presenting solo today. They had other obligations to attend to. All right. Well, if you're ready to go, then go ahead and share your screen and take it away. And everybody else, please mute. It is not letting me. Is it giving you a warning that you can't be on permission or something? Yeah. Let me see if I can. Give me one second. I might have to leave and come back. I don't know why it's doing this. That's okay. We're again, we're a little ahead of schedule. So take your time. I can thank our sponsors in the meantime, Carroll Community College, McDaniel College, Panacity, Cybersecurity Youth Apprenticeship Initiative, and Ting. And of course, uh, Magic, uh, our host, you know, I am the executive director of Magic, the Mid-Atlantic Gigabit Innovation Collaboratory. Um, this is our fifth annual hackathon for those of you who are uh, new to this hackathon. Um, and I tell you, it gets better and better every year. And, um, you know, the caliber of apps and the caliber of teams just continues to improve. So uh, great job to everyone who's presented so far. And I think we'll just have uh, the Vortex and shove it back here in just a minute as they re-log back in, hopefully with the right permissions. <laughs> Thank you again for everybody for joining us today. It's been pretty seamless so far, even being ahead of schedule for our first time doing this as a virtual format. So that's a, that's a nice surprise. <laughs> we, I think we, we afford ourselves several minutes, about 15 minutes for each team, given the, um, you know, usual, uh, you know, setup and, and, and transition time. And, um, you know, so, the, you know, so far so good. All right, shove it. Are you back? Not yet. Not yet. Well, considering this is the first technical difficulty we've had today, that's a good sign. <laughs> yeah, and we're still not behind, so. <laughs> All right, what we could also do is we could always come back to um, the vortex and shove it and move on to, oh, let's see, here she is. 
You admit her back. She's coming back in now. And Sarah, are you there? Yes, I'm here. It should work for me now. Go ahead and share your screen if you can. There you go. We see it. Okay. Let me get to the front. My computer was really having a problem there. I do apologize. It's um, no problem at all. If you're ready to go, feel free to just kind of collect your thoughts, take a second, and then take it away. Okay. So our app is called Shove It, um, and that was me, Sarah Norman, and my teammates, Alec Bolin, Jordan Spear, and Samantha Nicky. Um, this was our logo. It was designed sort of based off of the contents of our app, which I will get into um, through the rest of the presentation. Um, so a problem that we found um, is a lot of people, they might need someone to come plow their driveway or shovel the snow um, or mow their lawns for them because they either might be physically unable to do it, do not have the tools to do it, or they just don't have the time to do it. Um, but a lot of times with those type of providers, there's a very wide price range and it's really difficult to find them as many of them don't have websites or social media accounts specific to their um, type of jobs or work that they do. Um, and a lot of times, those providers offer the same exact services, but for wildly different prices, um, which can also pose the question of quality over price um, for those consumers that are on a budget. Um, the same thing uh, is an issue for the providers. Um, they might have had the same client base for years and years and years. Um, and a lot of times we see these type of providers they have road signs on the sides of roads um, or a lot of times getting new clients is just a fact of word of mouth transmission. Um, and it doesn't typically draw in a lot of new clientele for these sort of providers. Um, another issue is the risk of not getting paid for your services. Um, if you have a, a resentful client that maybe didn't like the work that you did, um, they might refuse payment, especially because there's no legal documentation that requires them to pay you for their services. Um, and again, the consumer need for these type of services, um, typically property maintenance services, which can be very difficult um, for people who might be older or have a, a disability or just don't have time to do it. Our solution was to come up with a platform um, for these providers to connect with clients in the area. Um, and then there would be a uniform price base across. Um, that way the clients do not have to choose quality over price. Um, and there would be a, a wide client base um, to bring in new clients and retain previous ones, um, as well as a, a, a wide provider base. Um, for clients to be able to choose different providers to do different jobs, or if they prefer one provider over the other, they can stay with that one. Or if the provider that they want is not available, they can get a different one to do the same job for them. Um, it's also a platform that will have secure and guaranteed payments of services. So these providers don't have to worry about taking time out of their day and doing these services for people and not getting paid for it. Um, so for our market, um, in Carroll County, 17.3% of residents in Carroll County are over the age of 65 and 7.9% of Carroll County residents live with a permanent disability. Um, and those two factors might play into why these people can't do these services themselves and why they might need assistance with them. Um, in Carroll County, there are 30,000 houses or homes um, and approximately 25% of them either don't own a lawnmower or are unable to mow their lawn due to physical or time limitations. 
Um, and that would leave us with roughly 7,500 Carroll County residents who need assistance with these type of property maintenance. Um, so our market would uh, be focused mainly on 30 to 60 year old adults um, and homeowners and renters within the Carroll County area. Um, and some of the sub markets that we would um, advertise to would be working parents of one or more children, um, elderly people and disabled people who all own homes. Um, so our app Shove It would allow you to search for a provider based off of the type of service that you need, as well as the distance that provider is from your location. Um, and it would also provide a platform to view what these providers were rated by other users of the app um, and what services they offer in addition to the services that you've selected. Um, we would also have a messaging platform for you to be able to contact these providers and ask them more specific questions if you needed to. Um, like you could ask the provider approximately how long it would take them to mow your four acre lawn um, as our prices would be per the hour as that's very common in that type of field. Um, so that way you could get a more accurate estimate of price prior to booking your uh, provider. Um, so our business model, we would, um, the average cost of service would be $20 per hour. Um, and we would assume that we would have approximately 500 clients using the app um, within the first year. Um, we would also assume that we would have approximately 70 providers within the first year and we would charge them a $10 monthly fee for advertising on our platform and using our platform. Um, we would also take a 10% commission from all of the profits that they would receive from each job that they've done, which would leave us at an estimated yearly profit of around $20,000. Uh, for the market adoption, we would use advertising on social media accounts such as Facebook or Instagram or Twitter, um, as well as advertisements within the Google Play and apps, Apple App Store um, to sort of help people find us. Um, when you search for an app on the App Store, it'll usually promote an application with an advertisement uh, as shown here, and then it will show you the application and other relevant applications to what you've searched. So most of our competitors, um, such as Angie, Benji, and Jobber, have a much broader market and include a lot of other specialized services that are not as widely requested, like home remodeling um, and repair businesses. Um, and a lot of those applications also include businesses that already have websites or business pages on social media. Um, those apps, the first three apps do not include the basic services like lawn mowing or snow removal. The other two applications I've included um, are specific to snow removal, um, but they require the use of a credit or debit card prior to using the app. Um, which can be concerning for a lot of users as they don't want to have to pay for an application to search for someone to pay. Um, what makes our app superior to competitors? Um, our application would be free to use and would require no credit card inf information until the payment of services. Our application has a simple and easy to use UI design and includes basic property maintenance services such as lawn mowing and snow removal. Our, all our prices are uniform, making the selection of a provider based off of personal preference and not price. Our consumers do not have to give up quality work for an affordable price. Um, and at this time, I'm going to switch over to the application. So our application would have a login screen um, and during the pandemic, we would like to include information about COVID-19 to help promote the safety of our, our clients. Um, and you do have to log in in order to use the app. 
And then once you log in, you can go to our safety waiver, which is also a liability waiver um, for both our clients and our providers. Um, and you would have to sign that before you could um, either work with our app or hire providers off of our app. And you can search based off of your zip code. So let's say you live in Westminster in the 21157 zip code. You can look for snow removal or assaulting, gardening, lawn mowing, or leaf removal. And you would come up to a page that has multiple providers on it. And you could narrow down your search by a five mile radius uh, or all the way down to a five mile radius if you want someone that is very close by. Um, and then once you've selected your provider, you can contact them and message them anything you want them to know about your property, um, as well as request specific services. And that will conclude our presentation. Great job, Sarah. Um, and uh, to the whole Vortex team and for the uh, Shove It app, great job. All right, let's uh, invite our judges to unmute and ask any questions for Sarah. Yeah. Sarah, great job, uh, especially uh, holding the, uh, the whole presentation up for your team together as yourself. Um, the, the one, and I really like how thought out your, your process was and how detailed you had thought about the problems and the solutions. I think one of the questions I would have for the business model though is, your, your target market um, or your target customer is not one that's usually very um, smartphone friendly. Are, are there other ways that you think you could try to reach that elderly um, or disabled population to try to get them, uh, make them aware of your, of your solution? So a lot of our elderly or disabled community um, is active on Facebook or has family members who are active on Facebook. Um, and since it is a local app, so within the, the municipality of Carroll County, um, a lot of people are very talkative. They talk to each other. They spread things through word of mouth and through posts on Facebook. Um, so our hopes and our thoughts would be that family members would see this app and realize that this would help that their aunts, uncles, grandparents, cousins, whoever might need it, and they would... Um, be able to direct them to use it. Um, a lot of our older community is moving towards smartphones, um, whether they like it or not. Um, many of their family members are pushing them to use smartphones. Um, we would also like to have a, a website for this application um, for those who still don't have a smartphone but have a computer. Great job, thank you. I do have a question. Um, in scheme of the app's usability, say I go on the app and I go ahead and I contact that person like you showed, what would be the next steps? Would they just contact me off app or would I get some sort of message via the app and would I pay through there or could I just pay through them outside of the app? So once you book with or once you message a provider, it'll give you the option to book with this provider. Um, and then once you select book with this provider, it'll have you input your credit and debit or credit or debit card information or PayPal or Venmo. Um, and then once you've input that information, it will hold on to that information until services are finalized by the provider through the application. Um, and then once the services are completed, um, it will charge your card the amount that it needs to. So let's say you're you're getting a lawn mowing service that's twenty dollars. It then it would charge your uh, card the twenty dollars if they were there for an hour. Let's say that I am an elderly woman and I don't particularly love the use of credit cards. And I my aunt, uncle, someone showed me your app and signed me up, and I wanted to pay you in cash afterwards. Would that be an option that I could then check off in the application? We could have uh, a, a cash option. Um, I did not include that in the original draft, um, but I feel like that would be a good option to include. Okay, thank you. I have some questions as well. Um, there are, I have a couple of questions. I'll, I'll ask them all at once, I guess, and you can answer how you want to answer. Um, one is vetting the providers, the service providers. Is there any sort of vetting process 
to uh, for those who are providing the service? And if so, what would that entail? The next question would be, could you go in a little more detail how you differ from TaskRabbit or Nextdoor, those other apps? Um, yeah, those are my two questions. Um, so for providers, we would ask them for a copy of their photo ID, which would have their name and address, um, as well as asking them for their contact information for outside the app. Um, that way we could make sure that they are who they are, as well as having them include a photo of themselves, um, just for verification purposes. Um, I am not familiar with TaskRabbit. Um, that did not come up in my searches. Um, I was doing more specified searches for um, like the services that we provide like lawn mowing and uh, snow removal and they did not come up. Okay. Um I would say, so, so TaskRap is basically a, it's a site for uh, Ozidens, handyman, snow removing, lawn removing kind of jobs. And that's similar um, in terms of that concept. So you um, check them out a little bit. They have a similar kind of model and, uh, and um, more of a task versus what an Angie list does at a, at a bigger level. And uh, Nextdoor is a, uh, an app that is look, a neighborhood based app for anything right? Not just for tasks, but a lot of people use that to post and share. I'm available to remove snow. Oh, I need something. Can you help me out? But it's all neighborhood based. So it's all geographically kind of centered. So take a look at those two as potential um, competitors as, as well. Um, and something to, I would just suggest in terms of vetting providers. I mean, if I have somebody come to my house, I want to make sure they're, especially if I'm elderly or disabled, somebody who we trust is, is a, uh, a good person, so to speak. Um, so background checks could be helpful for that. Uh, something you might want to consider adding into your, your business um, operations for, for that, not just an ID, but also perhaps background checks and such. Um, and uh, just a little, more, little, little bit of feedback. Um, I love your logo. It's really cool and slick. Um, but I would suggest if you're going to be offering services beyond snow removal, that consider having a more comprehensive logo that um, if someone sees it, they might think only snow, but you're like, no, no, we also do lawn. Right, is so you kind of want to make sure that that your clients think of you for more than just snow, if that's your plan. So, good job. Thank you. Any other questions or comments from the judges? I love that you already had the legal waiver written up. That was great. Great detail. <laughs> Thank you. All right, if there's no other questions or comments, we will let Sarah go. Of course, Sarah, you can stay and watch the rest of the presentations. Um, going once, going twice. All right, thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you to Shove It and the Vortex team. Up next, we have, uh, the team is M-A-H-A-A, -A -A, Maha, and the app is called Inform Mobile. Inform Mobile, are you here? Yeah, we're here. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, yes. If you are ready to go, uh, feel free to take over the screen sharing and everybody else, please mute while Inform Mobile is presenting. Okay. I think we actually are waiting on one more person. That's fine. He's just trying to find the link to the it's meeting. Coming. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, no hurry. We are four minutes ahead of schedule. Thank you to our judges again for taking time out of their Sunday to be with us. I'm missing college basketball right now, Graham. <laughs> much, I like magic. <laughs> and I'm not watching it on the other screen either. <laughs> so. Well, thank you for paying such close attention then to all the presentations. All right. Thank you for uh, your sacrifice, Jen. <laughs> I just let somebody else in. Was that the, uh, the other team member you're waiting for? Yep, so we're all here. Um, all right. I'll go ahead and start sharing my screen. All right, give me one second to move some things around. And I'm ready to go when you guys are all good. All right, so hello everybody. Thank you so much for being here today. Thank you so much for your time. 
We are Maha and we are going to be presenting to you our FI Dare informable, ride informed, ride smart. So meet Maha, we have Hamza Umar, Alex Lewandowski, Mikey Ibayan, Aiden Atkinson and me, Allison Dietz. And we are all mechanical engineering students at UMBC. And we're really excited to pitch to you our idea today. With the introduction of, of an autonomous ride-sharing infrastructure to the autonomous corridor, scheduling a ride while feeling safe about the vehicle you're about to enter and the potential buddy you'll be sharing the ride with uh, is our mission, essentially. Uh, we know that sharing a ride with a stranger in a new vehicle can be uncomfortable, and the new technology allowing ride-share vehicles to be fully autonomous comes with a unique opportunity regarding the way a driverless vehicle could communicate with a rider to ensure that the rider has the best possible experience. So our solution is to use the concept that knowledge is power. So we built Informable using that concept. So to make the consumers more comfortable with a new vehicle, we developed an app where you can get instant access to the information about the car, such as vehicle make, model, and year, any maintenance information, when it last had its oil change or what the tire pressure currently looks like, um, as, well, as well as efficiency information, and also ratings that were posted by previous riders that also took a ride in that same car. Additionally, Informable also helps consumers feel more comfortable with who they are ride sharing with by giving the consumer access to ratings of the possible fellow ride sharers. So this is just a brief overview of what Informable looks like. Informable is a mobile app that will seamlessly connect riders to autonomous vehicles and ride sharing buddies. A rider can request a pickup from a nearby autonomous vehicle and select the vehicle they want based on their needs, such as cargo space, accessibility, or even style. Riders can also request a ride share and view the profile of their ride buddy to either accept or reject the share based on how comfortable um, they feel with that person. Riders can also rate and comment on both the vehicles and other riders, and they can get important information about the vehicle that they are going to be riding in. Hello, so for market validation, um, it's pretty much the, the proof of concept for the need of the app. So there's a significant portion of companies investing into autonomous vehicles, both auto manufacturers and tech companies. So the market's expected to grow. Rider safety has been a previous issue with other companies like Uber and Lyft. So we hope to encourage people to use the app by knowing other users on the app that they're going to be sharing with. Over the years, there's been an increased demand for ride sharing. So it's more proof of the, we're expecting the market to grow. Whereas some old statistics we found in 2015, 15% of US adults had used a ride sharing app, and then 2018, 36% had. So the, mark, the number had grown in users. Um, we're hoping to aim mainly towards like cities where using having a car can be expensive, where you have to pay for parking, you have to pay for gas, you have to pay for insurance and maintenance, and you won't necessarily need a car to drive long distances because you're already in a city. So we're hoping to appeal to that market. So for the market size itself, Uber alone dominates the majority of the ride sharing market in the US with nearly 10 million trips per day in the US. So there already is a large portion of users. In the US alone, there's already 100 million users who have apps that connect them to things like Uber and Lyft or other taxi services. So there are already users in the market that we need to appeal to. There are other startup companies and other ideas that are already growing and researching. And as more car manufacturers produce new autonomous vehicles, it's expected for this market to grow even more. All right, so for our business model, uh, our key partners that we're looking to reach out to are autonomous vehicle manufacturers. Um, this would help us be able to seamlessly integrate uh, our app into autonomous vehicles, being able to get those stats that we need, um, as well as uh, existing rideshare companies. As rideshare platforms move to an autonomous option, uh, we'd like to be able to reach out to them. Um, and there's also the idea of doing uh, our app exclusively in something like the autonomous corridor, where we uh, would be both the host uh, for the ride share, as well as the supporting app. The way we're going to generate revenue uh, is through the um, ride sharing that the app supports and not the actual app itself. 
Uh, but we do have the option for potential ad space uh, within the app to just generate a little bit of uh, extra revenue, as well as possibly doing something in the future like a premium version, which might connect the user better to the vehicle to, say, give them access to play their Spotify or, or their iTunes. Uh, the market adoption. Um, so we're going to get people to use the app uh, simply because they need the app to, to use our service uh, the same way that Lyft and Uber do. Um, if they want to reserve a ride, if they want to use our service, they need the app. Uh, and we also want the app to sort of be a uh, cross verification for the profile um, and that we uh, they can use the app as a way for them to be able to know exactly who you are when it's time to, to get your ride and your app knows exactly uh, where to pick you up. Our main competitors are, like we've been saying, Uber and Lyft. However, future competitors like RoboTaxi, uh, of RoboTaxis like Waymo, AutoX, and Tesla. Um, Waymo is currently uh, operating driverless vehicles in San Francisco in beta testing, but AutoX actually just this past month uh, began full operations in China. And those are the exact operations that we are trying to match and or uh, reach out to. For the competitive advantages, we know that there is currently no app in the market like Informobile because like what we said before, this app is needed to be able to use the ride sharing capabilities of Autonomous Corridor. And again, this app is completely free. The revenue will be taken from the ride share platform itself. And for the cost requirements, the development cost, that is around $50,000 to $100,000 were estimated for the development of the app itself, the security, as well as converting the app from iOS to Android. And for the maintenance cost, this $10,000 to $20,000 is mainly for troubleshooting and fixing bugs of the app. Okay, well, thank you so much for listening to us. I will give you a quick demo of the app we have been working on so far. There you go. All right. Uh, one second. All right. So this is uh, our homepage. We enter an email address, you know, something, sign in. Uh, you get a little history of the cars you've written before and the people you've shared a ride with. Then after you order the car, you get a little information about the car, uh, including the mileage, fuel, any warnings about the vehicle, and what the vehicle really is, if, if it's an SUV or a sedan. And then after the ride is finished, you can leave reviews about the people uh, you've shared the ride with and just general information about them to improve the system overall. And that's about it. Any questions? Thank you very much. That was Informobile. Uh, is that the rest of that's, that's the end of the presentation, right guys? Correct. Okay, great. Go ahead and unshare your screen. We will ask our judges to unmute and jump right in with any questions or comments. And I will also note that um, Informobile uh, was responding to our autonomous corridor problem statement that was in the, uh, pre the opening of the uh, hackathon. Uh, great, great presentation team. And it's, it's def safety in either ride sharing or autonomous vehicles is clearly a big problem. So it, it's something that people are gonna have to address as, as we move forward. Um, one of the questions I would have about the business model, though, is that I'm not sure that uh, an Uber or Lyft is going to want to share their data, either about their cars or about their safety issues or their rankings um, with you. And they, they definitely are going to struggle to have a third party have access to all, the, all their other data. Um, have you thought how, have you thought about how you're going to kind of get or compel all those that could be competitors um, to, to provide you their data or work within your ecosystem? Sure, uh, so the biggest thing with this is the autonomous aspect of the vehicle. Um, and I think because Uber and Lyft and those other companies are, are lacking that platform, a lot of people are getting into a car that has a driver, it has somebody behind the seat uh, that is responsible. So when you get into an autonomous vehicle, there is nobody there and you have this uncertainty of, is everything okay? Um, you know, what is there that uh, could go wrong? You know, what am I getting myself into? And I think we can make Uber and Lyft, uh, you know, by proposing that idea to them where it's going in junction with the autonomous sector and not really the current ride sharing platform. 
um, because it does address a need that they won't have uh, if they decide to have autonomous platform to their um, ride sharing capabilities then they will have that sort of um, hesitation from their consumers to, to back those vehicles because of, of the unknown information. Um, but again, it could also just be reaching out to companies, like I said, like AutoX uh, and Waymo that maybe haven't developed their platform yet that are still in beta testing. Thank I have you. A quest I have a question. When do you see this beginning to scale so that it's sustainable? I mean, there's a lot of people that are very um, I'm a fan of autonomous vehicles, but there are a lot of people that are very weary and hesitant um, to get into a full, you know, full self-driving is still a little ways off. Um, how do you how do you expect to get people on board with this concept to make it something that's sustainable and achievable now? Uh, so the fact of the matter is, is it's not it's not really that far off. Um, Auto X actually last month uh, started fully autonomous, driverless, um, no uh, training wheels type runs um, in China. They are actually doing this. You can uh, go to a certain uh, city and province in China and get yourself a uh, autonomous ride share. Um, as laws uh, across other countries sort of push in favor of autonomous vehicles, uh, the U.S. is going to have to comply because it's where auto manufacturers and everything else is going to go, and it's going to be driven uh, by a need. Um, and it's one of those things where we are we are currently seeing this happen. So it's not a matter of of when; uh, it's a matter of how soon. Uh, Google is in San Francisco as of this month, uh, doing their driverless vehicles with no support driver, no nothing. Um, now that obviously is still testing and not uh, paid customers, but AutoX is doing it currently uh, 100%. Any other questions from the judges or comments? I will just add too that, um, you know, M Magic is, is sort of leading the development of the Autonomous Corridor Project here in Westminster. And, um, you know, our, our um, way of, of, of attacking this challenge, so to speak, is to create the, what they call the operational design domain. And then once autonomous vehicles enter that domain, that's where software like Informobile uh, and maybe others uh, today uh, would be utilized. So rather than a single company deploying their own fleet into their own operational design domain, the design domain would be owned by the municipality and all the automotive manufacturers, autonomous manufacturers would have to be compliant with that corridor. Any other questions or comments? All right, well, thank you very much to Maha and Informobile. Great presentation. Um, if we have, let's see, SAE 2.0 with the app Study Smarter, are you here? Yep, we're here. And are all your team members ready to go? Mm -hmm. I yes. believe so. Yeah. All right. Well, whoever's presenting, go ahead and share your screen and take it away. And everybody else, please mute while Study Smarter is presenting. Hello, my name is Emma Fleck, and my partners are Stephen Allen and Ashley Turnbaugh, and we are SAE 2.0, and we're going to be presenting on the app Study Smarter. So recently during the pandemic, we noticed there's an increasing problem with communicating with classmates that weren't, we hadn't necessarily met prior to the pandemic. Uh, we were lacking a lot of connections and lacking a community within our classes and our majors. So we we're trying to find something where we could bring all of this together without having any prior contact with those people. Um, and so what we came up with was Study Smarter, which is a web platform where users can communicate with past and current classmates to post questions or different ideas to different groups, um, make connections for job opportunities or find people with similar interests and just make studying easier and more efficient. Um, popular apps where students and users typically use to communicate are WhatsApp, Facebook Messenger, and WeChat. Each platform has over 1 billion users. 
And worldwide, 2.52 billion people use messaging apps. And of those people, 19.6 million are college students. And our, ta our target audience is actually the 1.8 million in STEM. Uh, Study Smarter provides a chat room where past and present students can communicate about homework problems, projects, or general advice. Students can join and create different groups based on their desired subject, major, class, and interest. Uh, students can post comment or uh, post comments or pictures where other students can react and provide insight. For our business model, we have two ideas on how to generate revenue, one being charging a subscription fee for the app and the other being adding advertisements to the app that businesses would, businesses would pay us to show. In order to market this app to our goal audience, we plan to advertise on college campuses by getting the college to market us, pitching to students at the start of the semester so that they feel more inclined to use it during that semester and also maybe emailing students and reaching out to them with a free trial or ad for use for the first semester to get them interested in the app. There are other available similar other apps sim available similar to this one, such as Reddit, Facebook, LinkedIn, and more, but Study Smarter prides itself in being tailored for students. Due to the pandemic, communicating with new classmates is difficult on most other applications where they require you to know an exact username before you can even communicate with someone. Study Smarter also works to monitor posts and comments to avoid negativity on the app. Due to it being tailored specifically to college students to communicate be between fellow classmates without prior connections, it is also a safe place for users to express their ideas and questions where helpful feedback is typical Users can connect with their peers based on general interests, classes, majors, and colleges. All right, so I'm um, Steven. I'm gonna try and get over here to the demo real quick. All right, so here is the home page of the Study Smarter app. At the top, we have, you can click on the home button, the profile button, the your groups button. This is a little direct message button. And then you can sign out, sign in, and reset your password. So here in the center of the page is your feed. So you can join groups as seen over here on the right. You can join groups and whenever there's any posts or anything in your group, it will show up on your feed. And you can either click on the link itself to go to the post, or you can come over here and click on the group to see all the different posts in the group. So here you can see how many posts have been made. And then you can also create a post. Um, here I'll go to, uh, where is it? Here, I posted a picture and it will pop up here. So students can post pictures of like questions or what have you. And then you can come down here and you can comment on it. And we'll go back to the home. So here you can come down here and then you, if you click on a name of another user, you can go to their profile. You can read all about them, come down. And then up here on the top right, you can add or remove friends. And go to your groups. So this is a page where it shows you which groups you made. And as of right now, I've only made one, one group. Here is my profile. We just click the button right here. And then the last big part is right here is the direct message. So you can come here and you can click on the little icon and you can choose to direct message somebody. Um, the neat thing about this app is that you don't have to have somebody as your friend to talk to them. You can just go here to your feed or join a general group and start chatting with people or talking to people or studying with people and making connections, even if you have not yet met them in person due to all the crazy COVID restrictions we have going on right now. And that's it. All right, well, thank you very much. Um, if that's the end of your presentation, please stop screen sharing and we will
ask the judges to unmute and jump in with any questions or comments. I have a couple of questions. Um, just uh, so the idea for, for this app is geared towards, if I understand correctly, um, like a particular school or class within a, within a college, say for example, is that right? So, so essentially yes, but within that, with all the groups and stuff, so you can create a group for like a specific class or like a specific major and then other students at your school can then join that group and then you're all connected in that one big group. Realistically, okay, you would so. be able to communicate with anybody, um, but we're just trying to gear it towards you can connect with people within your specific interest or major or even college. Okay, but the, the, the initial intent is to connect with people within your college, right? Not, yes. not like other, okay. All right, so because of, all right, so then that that leads my to my other question. I wanted to clear some clarification. Um, have you explored or do colleges currently have use uh, something similar to this across across camp? I know certain colleges probably do, some may not, may not. I'm just kind of curious if in your kind of market research, have you found any other um, similar type of technologies that are used that are, for example, built into their learning management system that they might use, like Blackboard or other things like that. Um, I know there's chat functions there for a class, and I don't know if it goes beyond that or not. But have you looked in on how um, how this would differ or complement or interact with that? Because I would assume if a college is already investing in that kind of platform, convincing them to invest in another platform will take well, some convincing. So I'm just kind of curious if you looked into that or not. Um, this app is definitely way more relaxed than Blackboard. I feel like uh, students are less inclined to use Blackboard to talk about class or their questions just because it's that formal environment and it is connected to where you get your grades posted and your professors post things. So um, it's kind of study smarter is definitely a step removed. And that's why we wanted to actually make it a free application, but we're going to uh, pro have advertisement if we do need that income, but it's definitely supposed to be a lot more relaxed than Blackboard. All right, I have another question. Um, how would this uh, be similar to or different to using something like Slack? Um, so the Slack is kind of like we stated before, it's like you have to be added into a group or know like specific people's usernames and so forth. But this, you can just join a group, even if you don't know anybody specifically, like you've never been to class, so you can never get their group me or their phone number. And same goes for Blackboard. Um, when you're in a class, you can only see those others in your class on like the discussion boards. Whereas this, you could just make a class or a group that would span three separate classes that are taking on the same, the same um, material. From a usability standpoint, if um, I'm going into your application and say I like I'm looking for a group that I want to be part of. If I can kind of just go into random groups, does that mean like just I can't if I go into a group that maybe I'm not even a class for? Does that mean you'll have like strangers in your group? And would you be able to kind of deal with that if maybe some like people outside of your group are coming into it? How would you kind of moderate the people who are in certain groups? That's kind of what we're saying as in it is being monitored to make sure there's no bullying or harassment on any platform. If to say someone from a different group did join, uh, we're definitely trying to join people with like ideas. So if you do wanna join, if you're not necessarily a mechanical engineering major and you would like to join a group that is mechanical engineering and have more information on that, that would be great. We're trying to be way more inclusive. So I think as long as you are being respectful, there's no reason why you shouldn't be a part of that group. Okay. If that makes sense. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Any other questions or comments from the judges? 
All right, then we will move on. Thank you very much to the team SAE 20 or 2.0 with Study Smarter. Thank you very much. Great job. We are going to move on now uh, to the team called Squirrel Codes, and the app is RCYCR. I don't know if I'm saying that right or not. Are you here? Yes, we are. All right. So if you're all ready to go, then go ahead and share your screen, take it away, and everybody else, please mute. Okay, so I'm gonna share my screen now and hopefully um, share. Can you all see my screen? Yes. Yes. Awesome. All right, so hello everyone. Um, we're Team Squirrel Codes. That's inspired by our team members, Lily's cat. Her name's Squirrel. Um, and our app today that we're presenting is called uh, Recycler, which stands for Recycle Rainforest. My name is Ashley and I'm here with the rest of my group. Okay, so uh, the problem that we wanted to tackle is the fact that many people are uh, interested in recycling and have a desire to recycle and understand the importance of recycling, but aren't exactly sure how. Um, much of what is intended to be recycled ends up in landfills uh, due to contamination um, because people aren't sure how to recycle. So our goal for this app is to provide an educational resource to people so that they can learn how to recycle correctly, um, but also make them aware of local recycling opportunities and provide a social aspect so that they are more incentivized to continue recycling. So our solution uh, can be understood in three easy steps. So first, again, we're going to educate our users on how to recycle properly. So using our app, they can find educational resources on how to recycle and what can be recycled at uh, different recycling locations. Um, and they can also find recycling locations near them using the app. Uh, users can also log when and what they've recycled um, so that they can receive points for recycling um, so that they can grow their own virtual rainforest. And finally, users can add friends so that they can see what their uh, fellow users are up to um, and provide a little bit of a competitive aspect to it, um, as well as sharing and connecting with others. Did you know that even though 94% of Americans support recycling and 74% of Americans would say it's a priority, only about 35% of waste is actually gets recycled? Uh, this is according to the public insert public interest research group, sorry. And this is because of wishful recycling, where people put waste in recycling that is unable to be recycled and therefore it will clog up recycling facilities. So there's plenty of apps on the market that can educate the public about recycling practices and locations, but none of them offer an incentive program or any type of social aspect. With Recycle Rainforest, we're trying to bridge the gap between recycling and community and make recycling fun. The current most popular recycling app is called Recycle Coach, and they have over 6.8 million users. But the thing that they're lacking is that social aspect and that incentive program. So that's where we step in. Um, and the other recycling apps in the market, they're either region specific or they don't even have three star ratings and they have tons of bugs. So one of the goals for the aesthetic of our product was to have a simple user interface that looks fun and vibrant, hence the bright colors you see once you sign into the app. Upon signing in, you have the choice to log your recycling journey, view other people's forests, and view the recycling feed. If you click recycling, you'll be led to a screen where you can log your specific recycling material and receive confirmation on if or if not it can be recycled. As for the incentive program, uh, after you log in your recycled materials and quantities, you will receive a reward in forms of gold leaves. You can use these leaves to buy space for more trees, buy new trees, and buy colors for your trees. In your feed, you can see what your friends are recycling and keep up with their forest progress. Initially, we planned to receive startup funds through Kickstarter and GoFundMe. However, if we could find an institution that has a poor actual recycling rate and wants to improve that rate, they would be a perfect partner for us to launch our app with. Over the long term, we plan to generate revenue through in-app purchases such as color palettes, limited time only trees, and additional gold leaves. Ads will also be used to generate revenue. They will only occur at the user's discretion. Users will be able to choose when they want to watch apps so they can be gifted free gold leaves. 
A premium version will also be offered so that users can experience a variety of new features such as interacting with a friend's rainforest. To get this product off the... Next slide. To get this product off the ground, we are hoping to get support from social media influencers and students to allow our app to quickly gain popularity. We also plan to use local national government support to spread awareness about the app in local and recreational parks. Finally, we want to spread awareness via community incentive and use of flyers in heavily populated areas. So as Jesse mentioned earlier, we do have a variety of competition in the recycling app space. The most common is Recycle Coach, which helps users identify recyclable materials and where they can recycle them. Um, an app with a similar mission to that is Recycle Nation. However, there are also a lot of other recycling apps that have different purposes. So for example, there's iRecycle, and so that helps people find specific locations to recycle, not so much information on what is recyclable. There's gonna be five, which is focused only on plastic materials. So it's any material that has the five on the bottom of it when it comes to the recycling numbers. There's also apps I've seen such as one where it's for preschoolers to teach preschoolers about recycling. Um, and then as Jesse said, a lot of them are regional, region, regional. So I've seen some that were only for like Australia or only the US or only certain states. So to make ours unique, it will be at least within the entire US, hopefully it'd be international. It re combines recycling with a fun incentive and it's reward system. So it's not just information, it's fun as well. It should be exciting and users want to use it um, rather than feeling like it's a chore. And then additionally, we would have less work with when it comes to putting in data to identify what locations are available for recycling. Since users will input that information when they log their recyclable items, they are telling us locations rather than we tell them locations. So thank you for your attention. Uh, right now, we're gonna go into a quick demo of what the user interface would look like. So here we have an example of what the startup screen would look like. And then you have the three choices. If you wanna recycle something, you would click recycle something. And then based on what you wanna recycle, let's say you wanna recycle something glass, you can click on this and then it would lead you to another path that lets you insert those items and get that confirmation. And then you can also do a quick list and it'll show you the types of glass items that you can recycle firsthand. Next, you can go to plastic, for example, and you can do the same thing. You just have different lists for each type of material. Um, then you have your forest and you would check on your forest daily, maybe to see if you have new trees that you can buy, things like that. Um, and then finally, you have your feed where you can see that other people are also recycling and also planting beautiful trees that you can go check on yourself if you're friends with them. So that's it for our presentation. Does anyone have any questions? Great job, great presentation. Thank you very much. Um, go ahead and uh, stop sharing your screen and then we will ask the judges to unmute with any questions or comments. Judges? I do have a question. Um, what stops somebody from falsely reporting things that they are recycling just to get the benefits? Can we bring back the, the screen really quick? We, we have some things prepared just in case certain questions were asked. Yeah, feel free to, to share your screen again if you need to. While it's loading, there's an app called Recyc RecycPay, I believe is how they probably want you to pronounce it. And it makes you scan barcodes. So that's basically the concept. Great, great presentation. I really like the, the, the design and the consistency of the format and, and the clarity. So it was very easy to, easy to follow. And, and I also think this is a, this is a problem very dear to my heart. I, I, I love recycling and in Carroll County, it kills me because most all of the recycling that's collected in our county gets landfilled. Um, but the big problem there is, has not historically been the actually contamination or the cross sorting it's that a lot of recycling is not economical anymore since China is not taking it. Hmm. Um, is there a way to gamify it or incentivize it so that we can, we can make the recycling economically profitable again? 
I, it seems to me that your your app is onto something and you've got a great idea of trying to gamify it or incentivize it. But it, it's my experience that if the economics don't work, um, a lot of times all the good intention doesn't doesn't help solve the problem. Right. So the app is trying to, you know how like Candy Crush, people play it for no real monetary incentive. It's just addicting. It's just instant gratification, colorful lights. That's kind of the concept of the rainforest. Um, but there is a program that already exists where it pays you cents on the can and stuff like that. So, I mean, the, in, for future work, it's possible we could implement something so they could actually have monetary benefits towards it. But for now, the concept was you have this, the cute little rainforest, and that's what keeps people coming. Um, also, we would have um, some actual data collected through the app since we are asking users to like log their um, recycling habits. So that could be useful um, and maybe beneficial to like local governments if they saw like real data of people actually trying to recycle. Um, that might provide incentive for them as well. Any other questions or comments from the judges? All right. Well, if not, thank you very much. That was a great presentation. Um, really resonates with many of us here in Carroll County uh, per Chris's comments. So thank you very much. All right. Thank if, you. Thank you. Thank you for having us. You're welcome. Thank you. And if the team Cicada 3301 with the Public Access 25 app is ready to go, are you here? Yep. All right, great. Well, feel free, whoever's presenting on your team, to start sharing your screen. The rest of us will mute while we watch your presentation. I, I, I got it, Google. And Aiden, you might be um, sharing, I don't know if you're sharing your whole desktop or if you're sharing just the Discord window at the moment, but um, when you okay. click, I think it did not open up the presentation for us to see. Okay. Uh, when you hit share screen, there's, um, you can hit on the right, you can click on like share the entire screen instead of just like a, a window. Uh. <laughs> So you may want to unshare your screen and then uh, pull up your presentation and then share your screen. Okay. And take your time. We are uh, nine minutes or so ahead of schedule. So we're doing good. You still there? And yeah, Google. Um, I'm having a problem with sharing it. Do you wanna? Do you wanna take it? Yes. I'll share my screen. No, you cannot start. But you have to stop sharing your screen in order for me to share my screen. Okay, where's the share your screen feature? That's. Uh, that's it's on top. Zoom. Yeah, at the top of your Zoom window, Aiden, there will be a um, stop sharing your screen option. It should be at least if you're on a laptop or desktop. Oh, I don't have the Zoom app. <laughs> uh, I, I will jump back out. Yeah, that's okay, I just, I, I ended it for you. Um, so uh, Google, if you are there and can share your screen, then All right. should suffice. Let's see. Advanced. All right, I think I'm sharing my screen. You are, yep, we see your whole screen. All right, so 
Oh, wait. Wrong slide. You're good to go. All right, so our app idea is, it's called uh, Public Access 25. And our motto is, nobody does it like Public Access 25. And uh, the, the idea behind the app is that there are uh, many companies, many websites, many groups that have websites and they have applications and um, they, they can, but the problem is that they don't have accessibility for people with disabilities and stuff. So our app, there are, there are two principal goals behind it. The first goal is that uh, when the user logs into the app, what they can do is that they can go on a, a web feed and on the web feed, they can look up articles related to a, a specific website or a specific group and they can, um, um, they can look up articles related to it, seeing uh, related to disabilities and seeing what each company is doing related to disabilities and stuff. And then the, the second part, uh, the second solution uh, is that if a company wants to take a screenshot of their website and they want to uh, post it on the app, they can and users can comment on it and, and say, well, here's what you can do in order to make the, the, the app better um, for people with disabilities. So for the market share, uh, approximately 71% of businesses uh, have an app. However, only 34% of those businesses have apps that are audited for accessibility. Um, the, the market size, uh, roughly 20% of Americans have disabilities and the, that's roughly 55 million people. And uh, companies, um, approaches, companies with approaches amenable to people with disabilities to better on, to better, um, <laughs> sorry, lost my train of thought. Um, to better, uh, to vastly better on the, do vast, vastly better on the market space and accruing talent. So, um, yeah, uh, the product, the, the product idea is that you can upload screenshots, you can post comments, you can search for stories. Um, and there, we do have competition inside the market. We, there are a few websites and stuff that, that cater to it. Uh, so there is disability that uh, disabilitynewsscoop.com, but it doesn't have any like comment section or or community feedback, and it doesn't have like targeted news on specific companies. Like there's you can't look at a specific company and see what it's doing. There's accessibilitynews.com, and that doesn't doesn't offer any uh, community feedback either, and it doesn't even have an app. Um, but there is one application that is on the, the, the Play Store and on Apple iOS, but it doesn't address any targeted company with the accessibility information. Um, and it's, it's very, our, our thing is unique in how it, it communicates and how it, it tackles these problems with people with disabilities. Um, and the, for the business model, it, it's a simple um, run banner ads across the top, across the bottom. It's uh, five dollars for every fifty interactions with the app, and we charge that. And uh, the competitive advantages we have is that we have we have a, a web scraper that that caters specifically to disabled people, and the ability to engage the community to discuss and give feedback. So uh, here is a a demo of our app. Um, so if you, what you can do is you can type a business in here and it will, uh, it will show articles related to it. So there's, there's, here's articles that are related to McDonald's and disability. Uh, the, the API that we're using for this, it's not the, the API would use for the final project. It's just the example API. Uh, it's a new scraping API. Um, and then for an idea, what we could do is we can look up, uh, you could put, put in your website name or like a title and you could say, um, right. And you can uh, look at an image. You can upload an image of your website, right. And you can say, uh, how is, how do I make my website better in terms of accessibility? Ah, spelled it wrong. 
There we go. And you can uh, post that. And this is a, I think this, uh, it's, is supposed to, it loads them in. Yep. And you could look at the, you could look at different examples of it and you could put a comment on it. You could say, you know, it's, it's a little, a little crowded. You can make a comment and it will post the comments underneath the, uh, the thing and it, it, it should load, but we've been having problems with the uh, website. So you know, there's our presentation. Great job, guys. Um, go ahead and yep, unshare your screen and uh, we will kick it over to our judges for questions and comments about public access 25. I have a question for you guys. Have you thought about working with any um, organizations or groups that are supporting those with disabilities to kind of see what, you know, how they could support what you're doing um, or provide, you know, any input and ideas as well? Or are you just looking to kind of crowdsource from the community in general? I'll take this one. Um, uh, so can everybody hear me just to be clear? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay, thanks. Uh, there is, there are companies that offer like sort of like clearinghouse information on what is best for people um, with disabilities in like the workspace in public spaces, uh, specifically in like construction, construction types of situations because of the ADA and how that was implemented in the 2000s. Um, we, are, we are looking at taking taking information from those places, I think it would go a long way in uh, building, building an information set to put on the website and have like a list of uh, recommendations ready. Um, I think that would be valuable uh, in, you know, pr providing some credibility to the information we're putting out there as like a background. And so, yeah, I think that would be a great support in building this website. I have a question. Um, so the purpose of this app is uh, not only to provide uh, news content regarding uh, the topic of disabilities, but also to, if I understand correctly, um, provide some guidance on how other people can make their websites or their their um, make their websites more accessible as well. Is that correct? Is it to help folks um, create more? accessible sites and, and imagery and everything? Is that part of the app? Yeah, that is what uh, Google is demonstrating. Um, right. We're trying to, uh, so we're really interested in making it a space where people discuss and critique accessible ideas. Um, not so much like to tear people down, but it should be a space where people, people bring shared ideas about accessibility, emerging ones and existing ones. Um, from like screen grabs of existing websites and people even bring their own websites and dropping them in to say, hey, what can I do better? So. Have you guys looked into, um, say, have you guys looked into section 508 of the Rehabilitation Act of 1970, I think it's three. Uh, so, uh, so there are, um, there are there might be some these might be some things you actually pull into your site actually to help do that canned um, set of um, guidance and, and advice and stuff. But there are a bunch of requirements written for um, best practices on accessibility for websites for apps and such. Um, and I know a lot of website builders have ADA compliance as part of their services that they provide in terms of making sure sites are ADA compliant. Um, Section 508 uh, also lists a lot of specific things. So that could be a good place where you have to pull some of that, um, that information to kind of help make your app more robust to in terms of how you help other people do that. Um, just FYI, all, all government related websites have to be 508 compliant to for accessibility purposes. And that comes from section 508 of the um, Rehabilitation Act. So that's a good place for y'all to kind of look for some more guidance on some of the stuff because that is something that everybody has to follow 
if you're doing anything um, that's a public facing site from a public sector entity. So. Thank you very much. I did not know that about the government related spaces, but that'll be something that we'll include going forward. Yeah, those requirements in there could help guide what you guys are trying to do to help private sector companies and individuals who try and make things a little more accessible. Um, so those could be a set of guidance you can follow as well as, like I said, a lot of website building companies um, have ADA compliance as one of their offerings too. Very cool. In addition to, to Jennifer's comments, there's, there's actually an association of consultants that do website design that are specifically focused on meeting those requirements. So I would definitely reach out to the association of the ADA compliant consultants. Um, I, I think they were actually headquartered in DC. I don't think, I think they're right here close to us. Yeah, there's a lot of resources out there. So it could help you guys either augment what you're offering or help you differentiate better, right? So if, if there's all these different sources out there ready helping people develop better sites and graphics and apps, then that might help you guys maybe narrow your niche a little bit or pivot a little bit uh, depending on how you want to differentiate. So these are just kind of more things in the marketplace for you guys uh, to explore. Absolutely. We will be looking at this going forward. Any other questions or comments from the judges? If not, we will thank our Public Access 25 team. Gentlemen, thank you very much. <laughs> Thanks. Sorry we don't have cameras. <laughs> <laughs> and um, we will queue up um, Teletubbies with the app Mall Maps, as, which is our final presentation of the day. Um, is tele Team Teletubbies here? All right, I see someone waving. Okay, great. So go ahead, share your screen. Uh, you're one step ahead of me. And everybody else, please mute while they are presenting. Uh, just a quick question. You guys could see the presentation? Uh, yes, looks great. Okay. Um, Ryan. Hello, everybody. Um, my name is Ryan Bayanako. My name is Roberto Flores. My name is Jane Akintoy. And my name is Katie Ann Carr. And I think one of our members got disconnected. So, Well, our last member's name is Erin Kalelu. And all together, we are the Teletubbies. Today, we're going to present our uh, hackathon idea, uh, which is Mall Maps. Uh, so, so in the course of this presentation, in the course of this presentation, we will further go into the details of the problems and why it matters. Following that, we'll explore our ideas and our possible solution to this uh, uh, issues that may occur in large scale uh, mall models. Thank you. Uh, sorry for like the back and forth. My keyboard is very sensitive. <laughs> Um, so what's the problem? So we were discussing one day about any scenario we've ever been, and we all experienced that sometimes when we're in a heavy, very big mall, per se, for an example, King of Prussia, which is, I believe is the biggest mall in North America. Sometimes there's always zones where you have almost no access to the internet. And on top of that, the mall is so big that sometimes when you're, let's say you go to one of the kiosk tasks and to request a path as to how to go to a certain store, you may, at, at, at first glance, you're like, okay, I got this. But once you like start going on that path, maybe two minutes later, you're like, you may go, wait, where was I going? We've all experienced that. And then ultimately what doesn't help is the fact that there's no internet service sometimes. So we can't simply just go look up, excuse me. We simply just can't go look up, oh, where is this store or where is this? Um, a lot of this is due to confusing layouts and just it's just easy to get lost. And ultimately this problem happens a lot is because of the materials being used to build malls. It is known that metals have interfere a lot with um, cell service. And that's sometimes part of the issues that happen. And on top of that, malls have very heavy traffic, especially during the times of Thanksgiving and Christmas time, where there's literally people, it's literally like as the picture shown, there's almost no room to walk. And then all that bandwidth is being occupied by so many cell, um, cell phone services. It just makes the, the whole service um, 
your service just unusable. All right, hello. Uh, my name is Erwin. I didn't get to introduce myself, but I'm Erwin. Uh, so now I'm going to be presenting a little bit about uh, the, uh, our idea of what we, how we, the things we want to focus on to solve, to address some of these issues. So Roberto can go up to the next uh, slide. So some of the things we're going to focus on. So in some malls, uh, the cell service can be too spotty to connect online. Uh, you know, this could be due to a couple of different things, such as like, you know, the size of the mall and the, or even the construction of, uh, of the mall. Um, another uh, one of our focuses is that some malls have a few kiosks, few kiosks or slash interactive screens for directions. So finding a way to uh, address the, the limitedness of information inside those malls to, to uh, be more, to be more, to, to try and find a way to, to uh, deliver information uh, over a wider area is one of the things we're trying to focus on with this app. Um, people, so with by by having information being delivered more uh, easily uh, or, or at least more in any in any area of the mall, it will be easier to remind someone who is trying to get to their destination. It will be able to, to keep them on track the entire way through without getting lost. And so, and and as, as well as like trying to address the spidiness and connections, it would be if if we are able to have an app that you know is able to be downloaded with a with a map already installed of of the map that the person is at with uh, inbuilt directions that it that would also address uh, several of these internet connection issues. So as previously mentioned. Really, what we're trying to do, really, what we're trying to, uh, really, what we're trying to propose, we're proposing is having an app that's already pre-downloaded in your phone, such that it doesn't rely on the internet connection, and also, you know, it's something that you have with you as you are on your way to the mall. So there's no need to, there's no need. Uh, so you won't be easily lost uh, in the crowded environment, and this is oh uh, in. What we're trying to do, we want to make sure that this ecosystem, this platform is very user friendly and straightforward for the person using it. Uh, we want to make sure that as an app is something that can easily be, uh, that can direct the person easily without any confusion and such that we can focus on its accessibility and functionality. Next is our model of to how this idea uh, will continue into something that will be fully usable by uh, the user. So as of now, uh, within this time frame in 2020, um, it's uh, we will you will focus on having legal uh, ownership of this idea because we know while we're using Python to uh, generate a solution, right? Uh, this is a platform that's free and can be um, modeled and replicated by any other person. However, because we uh, want to take ownership on, ownership on this idea and make sure that uh, it's user friendly uh, for everybody else, you know, we are uh, and we are the ones serving. Um, um, we are the ones doing um, putting the service out there because you know, we fear that there's um, cybersecurity uh, um, issues later down the line. So our goal is to make sure that we're working um, with strategic partners an investor to make sure that this project is fully funded and also is accessible from any, wall, uh, any malls in America. Following that, we will uh, continue with a beta test where we can take uh, feedbacks from the user to make sure that we can keep track of what works and what the, uh, needs some work. Lastly, uh, we will want this project, this, uh, this idea to be fully stable by the end of 2024 and we think that we, because it's something that's uh, done through Python and can easily be interchanged, uh, we, might, uh, we might be able to do it even earlier. Thank you. So for the solution to this problem, we've been able to create a Python code in the Anaconda environment to be able to combat these complex conflicts with mall navigation. Next slide. We're still working on transferring this code to create a mobile app. 
So far, the code will initiate with the interface that you'll see on the right side. It will welcome the user to the mall map environment. It will ask, and then it will prompt the user to give its um, coordinates and floor level. Next slide. Okay, so as, as you can see here, um, we have some screenshots of the code. So on the, as Jane was saying earlier, um, these codes have been developed in a virtual Anaconda environment by using Python. Um, these Anaconda environments have been written using YAML files, so they can be downloaded by anybody using Windows, Mac OS, or Linux. Um, the next thing that these Anaconda environments do is that they install these package dependencies that we're using, which are mostly image processing package dependencies in order to get the code to work and to pull up the mall maps. On the right here is a picture of one of the functions that's in the mall, the actual like GUI, so the graphical user interface to um, look at the image. Um, and this one is, this one gets the list of the map from a list of images. So what happens is, as was on the previous slide, the user is prompted to enter the name of the mall map, replacing all spaces with hyphens. And then what this does is it goes and searches through and sees, is this the mall map you want to look at? If it's unable to find a map with that name, then it will spit out an error for the user and say, can't find this. Um, and then the button, the next command after that is the button. So you put in the name and then you hit find mall map, and then it will search through available images. So next slide. Um, so continuing from that, something that's really important to point out is that if the user has an image of a mall map on their phone already downloaded, what they can do is just simply insert the name of that file onto into this app, and this app will find that mall image for them, which eliminates the need for having any kind of internet connection. Um, here we have another function that's in this image process, the mall map image processing GUI app. Um, and what this does is, um, if a user taps on where they are or taps on the image, it grabs the coordinates of that image. So like an image being a matrix and it will grab the X, Y coordinates of where that person is. And so what the user will be prompted to do is tap once for where their current location is and tap again for where they would like to go. This function here, what it does is it grabs the pixel coordinates of those two taps. And then from there, the next step in this image processing GUI is to then implement that to create a path for how to get from these sets of coordinates to the next set of coordinates. And thank you. Any questions? Great job. Excellent. Um, go ahead and unshare your screen, and we will ask our judges to unmute and ask any questions or comments uh, for the Mall Maps app. That's a uh, really interesting idea and a great business case. Um, how do you plan to acquire? The, the mall layouts and what stores are in which facilities? Are you going to partner with the mall or is the mall going to input their own maps? How, how do you plan to kind of acquire your data to make it valuable for the uh, user? Yes. Yeah, so for, um, for any local malls, we would simply just drive to the mall and then take a picture of like the layouts and then from there input, insert it into our codes or into like, I guess you could say the database in order for it to do the calculations to calculate, um, I guess the distance and tra trajectories on how, what path to take to go to, to a certain place. As to for a bigger mall, it's it would simply be either contacting them to see if they could send us any information or like pictures of those layouts, or like, or like you said, possibly, um, I guess he's, uh, how to say, partnering up with them. It'd be a further thing to be um, investigated. As for getting like the stores and stuff, so the way that we're looking at mapping this is by actually using like a series of um, if statements in the code. So basically what happens is, is that, so mall maps come in like a variety of colors and like typically the path where people walk on is white and like where stores are is like blue or like yellow or like some other color. Um, and so the plan for this is to basically say, okay, um, these stores are blue. So stores are blue and like white is like where people can walk. So by doing this, the first um, implementation or the first loop is like, you have to chart a path, but we can only do it along the white pixels. So any kind of path that's blue pixels, like nobody can go through there because that's a store. The next step is to also get the, um, coordinates for like where certain stores are. Additionally, because the user is tapping where they want to end up on the map. So they're not just tapping where they are, but where they want to end up. Um, the mall map doesn't necessarily have to get the location of every single store in the map so much as it needs the location of where all the stores are. And it needs to be able to sort the pixel, the RGB pixel values in order to differentiate between a walkable path and a store that's here. 
So yeah, to add to that, that just means that any uh, images that we get from any malls, maps, uh, can work with this app because you know uh, by just focusing on some legends and color codes, we can easily uh, trans we can easily target the the best path for the person to be able to uh, get to their destination. And out of our partnership with you know any malls from local area to a larger area. Uh, we can easily adopt this model for any uh, any maps. Thank you. I have a question. Um, you said that one of the, the things that you were looking for was getting rid of the need for an, an internet connection. So does that mean having this app on my phone would mean that I have pictures of all of the maps of malls in whatever location on my phone? Also, how would you deal with the data size? So one of the ways we're looking at dealing with the different data sets is um, for one, we're looking at having the user, um, ideally you would have the mall map already downloaded on your phone, but if not, then one of the things that we're looking at is having it be like a local mall map thing. So before you lose like your internet service, it's like, oh, if you're in like this region of malls, then you're not gonna get like all malls in America. You're going to get like within like a 20 mile radius. So it's only going to be a few maps that you can select from and not like hundreds of mall maps. Right, and you know, one of the other ideas that came up uh, for to make sure that this is accessible is if you don't know, or you know, if you don't have access to the map beforehand, before you go to, to the location, you know, with, you know, links uh, or QR codes, we've seen that those are also easier way to access uh, the app on your phone. So it's something that can easily be, uh, you know, easily be, within your phone by just a scan or by just clicking the link. Um, I'm also curious how you're charting the path from one location to another, uh, like what, what the algorithm for that looks like too. Can you talk? Okay. Oh, sorry, like many thoughts about this kind of stuff. Um, so what we're looking at doing is like I was saying earlier with a series of if statements, um, one of the big things is like actually pulling all the pixel value, like using a, a series of if statements to pull the pixel values for like all the blue ones. Um, one of the, the downsides to this so far is that like, if we have like a map that has like blue for both stores or blue is like an example, but if like the color of the paths is similar to the color of the stores, then this would create a problem in that because it's like a range of pixel values that we're looking at. Um, and so that's the first way that we're looking at charting all these different mall or the different like ways to get there. So what happens then is like, um, is we're actually using like a kind of like masking idea where basically what happens is it's like, if there are blue pixels, those get masked out. So we're only looking at the white pixels and that's the kind of algorithm that we're using to then, or not algorithm, it's really like a series of like functions. Um, and then from there, once the blue pixels are masked, only that, the only thing that remains is all the pathways, um, which are white or a different color. And then, so then from there that can just plot which way is the best way to get there. So. Did that, did that make sense? I also like to point out that this is not something that's, uh, you know, that's just um, used, that we can use right here. Uh, it's something that has been developed in other research uh, fields, uh, for example, for bioimaging, for example, and be able to scan, uh, be able to target tumors and things of that nature. They're using images and processing images to, and also using some sort of legend to locate where tumors are. So, you know, we're kind of reusing that same idea to say, well, if we use the images of the malls, how, uh, and we can use that same algorithm to point the user from their uh, current position to their destination. Any other questions or comments from the judges? Yeah, I don't know if I, this is just something I may have missed, but did you have any wireframes for the front end of how the site or the app would function for user experience? Sorry, can you repeat that please? I'm sorry, did you have any wireframes? Like when a user comes to the actual application, what are they seeing when they have to walk through oh, all of the pieces of your- Yes, that was on one of the previous slides actually. Right, I might've just missed that, all right. I was just wanted to make sure. <laughs> And I actually have a question, although I'm technically not a judge, but can you currently play games like Pokemon Go inside a mall or does the metal construction element prevent that from happening? Yes and no. You normally could play it as long as you have a decent service, but there will be moments that, um, because I, I've done this myself, like sometimes just out and about, I'll play in the mall 
and uh, sometimes the when the service just goes down, your phone, the what's it called, Pokemon Go just stops working in a way. Like it's not, um, like basically you're at that point where it's like it's just frozen. And you're always getting that red sign of like no internet connection. That's just what pops up. And I ask because I wonder if there's other elements of gamification inside the experience of a mall that you could explore to incentivize people to use it and for the malls to adopt it because i mean let's face it malls are sort of a dying you know business model at least in some places and they need things like this i would think to draw people back in give them a reason to maybe it's plotting an exercise path through the mall you know um or or you know, going to certain you know geocached spots within the mall that you have figured out that are local on the phone. Um, those seem like uh, some some ideas that could get the malls excited about it because it means more engagement with the public. Yeah, that's very true because you know uh, working going to the mall that's a two way uh, interaction, and we believe that uh, you know in the first place we need to make sure that people are not as confused as they are trying to find the mall, right? And also if people are confused from finding the malls or their destination, the mall are you losing money in ads and, and all the stuff that they're trying to do to get the person's attention. So overall, that's something that can easily be, uh, you know, um, within the app uh, and its structure. So I think it's uh, something that can work very well. Yeah, because you're solving a couple of problems. You're solving the mapping issue of knowing where things are once you're in the mall, getting lost in the mall. And you're really solving the issue of engagement and bringing people away from Amazon and into the mall for an experience that your app could be cultivating. Any other questions or comments from the judges? Just real quick, um, I guess to echo that too, is that I, I do encourage you guys to think about other, other uses of the application um, because I guess, depends on the mall, but a lot of the malls currently today, you know, they have these well-designed maps already, right? In terms of the mall layout and where the stores are and all that kind of stuff. So it is a lot of effort for you guys to kind of recreate, re to recreate that. And for folks to use it, um, the, the value has to really be articulated very, very well for someone, for a mall to adopt that or for a user to adopt and use it. So just give that some thought. Um, because a lot of malls already, like for me, when I go to Tyson's mall, there's that kiosk, you can type on it. They actually, on the big screen, maps out how you walk to get to the store. And then I just take a picture of that. And then I, and that's how I do it right now, right? Yeah. So, um, so to encourage people to kind of adopt something new, think of other, think of ways to kind of hook them in. And what Graham is saying might be one way to do that. It'd be kind of creative to do um, derivatives of this main concept. And then if you do these derivatives, then and you actually could potentially partner with the mall directly and use the data they already have in terms of the store layout or sorry, the mall layout to save you guys time and effort for have to go and figure that out yourself since they already have that. But you guys bring another value in, so they might be willing to partner with you and give you that information. And that could be a win-win for both sides. So think about, think about that as you build out your business model. Yep, excellent point. Thank you. Any other questions or comments from the judges? All right. If not, then we will conclude our presentations for the day. Thank you very much, uh, Teletubbies team with Mall Maps. Um, and to everybody who's presented today, what we're going to do now is we're going to put the judges in a breakout room and we're going to end this live stream currently. And then we'll be back in, I guess, about 15 minutes to give the judges uh, enough time to deliberate. And then we'll, we'll start the live stream again. We'll keep the Zoom going here for all of you who are already in it. We're not gonna end the Zoom call, but we'll end the live stream presently. And then we'll start the live stream again when we bring the judges out of the breakout room. All right, uh, stay tuned, everybody. Thank you very much. We're just gonna end the live stream. So if you're watching on YouTube, please come back in about 15